on the road. Okay, good evening, members. You're all very welcome to our monthly meeting here for March in the Grange. So first of all, what I want to do is I want to uh, take any apologies. So, Adam. Uh, thank you, Chair, just Councillor McGrath. Thank you. Debbie. Um, Councillor Marty McColgan and um, Catherine Kelly. Yeah, thank you. And John Feely running late. Okay, Paul. Councillor Mark McKinnon can't be here because of his grandmother has passed away. Oh. So maybe it's Adam we let her or not here. We can do indeed. I'm sure we all send our condolences there. Okay, no other apologies. Okay, we're going to go to our first item here is the sign and confirm the uh, minutes of the full council meeting of the 6th of February. So for accuracy first, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and twenty one. And I have a proposer, Earl, and seconded by Victor. Thank you. And for we'll just confirm the right do the accuracy of the special council. Yeah. So we're going to do the accuracy for the special council meeting, and that was the Thursday, the eighth of February. So for accuracy, page one, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And Paul proposing, second, and Josephine, thank you. Okay, have we? Any declarations of interest? Okay, no indications. So we're going to take matters arising then from the Bottle Council meeting. That was the 6th of February Bottle Council meeting. So for matters arising, page one, two, Thank you, Chair. Just at the top of page two, um, I'd been asked to provide some further clarity in relation to the appointment of special advisors and those who remain then as councillors. So circulated with the papers is the code of conduct for special advisors. The provisions uh, for local activities are detailed on page seven of the guidance, Chair. I have also written to the Department for Communities, but I haven't received any response at this stage. Okay. Barry? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll come to that item, but just on page one, page one, condolences and then expressions of best wishes, you know, on health grounds. I wanted to just uh, suggest that we, whether we write or whether we merely express it publicly, uh, our best wishes at this time to President Michael D. Higgins, um, who was... Uh, taken ill last Thursday and went to St. James's Hospital in Dublin. And I think he's to remain in hospital until Thursday of this week. Um, publicly, RS Nuktron are saying that his test results have been positive. He's going to meet with the Taoiseach on Friday and he's keeping up to speed with various legislative issues. 
even when in hospital. So President Higgins means a lot to very many people in this district and has visited the district. Just looking over to my left, I recall Councillor McCann hosting uh, Michael D. Higgins um, at Thrumra, GA grounds and various other places. I recall that. Uh, so I just I just wanted to say that and whatever is the appropriate mechanism for conveying that, uh, can I propose accordingly? Yeah, and I, I'm sure you are wishing us to write to... Yeah, I uh, propose a red letter, Chair. Thank you very much. No. Thank you, Barry. And just on uh, on the other end. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Um, uh, it's a very interesting document. Um, and uh, page seven does um, does make it look as if it's quite restrictive for any special advisor um, in terms of local political activities. Like look at six D, for example. The onus is on that person to declare an interest in relation to any case or application which comes before the council where local ministers or a government department is involved. So, you know, I I just wanted to draw attention to that because I do remember uh, a councillor in Mid-Ulster facing a dilemma of this nature, um, Councillor Ronan McGinley at the time. And that's it. I just wanted to make that observation. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Stephen. Thank you, Chairman, and just want to second uh, Councillor McAuliffe's proposal in terms of writing to President Higgins and, of course, want to wish him well for a speedy recovery also. Okay, members, are we all in agreement? Yeah, thank you. Seamus? Uh, yeah, uh, just on uh, the item that uh, Barry mentioned there about the special advisors, I was maybe hoping uh, that... Uh, when we have the special advisor, maybe uh, he could update us on the progress of bringing services back to the the SWA uh, now when we're all here and we're all eight years. Adam? Thank you, Chair. And I was going to come in slightly later on page four in, in kind of a similar vein to what Councillor Green has done. And it was kind of noting that we hadn't had a word back from, from Robin Swan. I appreciate I've kind of skipped on, but it is linked to what has just been said. Um, and I, I do believe Councillor Robin suggested that we'd have a, have a direct line and be of much benefit. So maybe if it would be appropriate for him or he feels it would be appropriate, could he answer if the minister has received the invitation? Uh, if he has the intention to accept it, I can see him shaking his head, he can't answer. Uh, and when we could expect word back on it, I don't know if he can, but it'd be useful if he could. You know, we've never had this uh, presence of a special advisor really in, in the council that we could perhaps use, but I don't know how much he can do um, in lines with that guidance that was there, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. All I can tell you at this point is that he isn't indicating to speak. Um, Nolan? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Just on that um, issue of the Department of Health not responding to the request we put in the last council meeting, could I take this opportunity now that there is uh, a new minister in place to put the same questions there directly to the minister and ask him if he will, in his delegations with the budget, um, put women's health, uh, specifically the, uh, the women's health Centre in Lisner Ski, GP elective services as a priority and maybe part, uh, consider it part of a plan for a women's health hub in the district. Maybe it's a SWA hospital. So the same questions again. And then if you could put that as a priority, if we could get an answer back, please. Thank and you, Chair. are you proposing, Nolan, that we, we write? Yes, please, yeah. Chair. Okay. And Debbie? Um, slightly different, um, but it's uh, in relation to women um, because we're, we're obviously not getting any response from the minister regarding the women's facility. But um, on the back of that, um, if it's OK, could I propose, because there is an issue, we, we, we've come a long way as women in terms of equality, but there's still quite a long way to go. And I would like to propose that the um, council offer gender equality training to all councillors and all staff. Please. Okay. 
Thanks, Debbie. Nolene, I'm conscious. Yeah, I'd just like to second that proposal, please, Chair. So you're seconding, Debbie? Yeah. Okay. Members, are we agreed on Debbie's proposal, seconded by Nolene, to offer a uh, look about offering the gender equality training and so forth? Yes, all agreed. Okay. Uh, I haven't got a seconder for Nolene's. So, Councillor Dehan is seconded. Are we all agreed that we would uh, write uh, encompassing the points that uh, Nolene has outlined? Okay, thank you. And could I have a proposal and seconder then uh, to note the um, uh, Code of Conduct for Special Advisors paper? And Earl and Garvin. Okay, thank you, members. And we're going to move on from page two, page three. Chair, just to note correspondence received from the DFI in relation to some follow-up queries from the special council meeting. You need this. Yeah, can I have a proposal and seconder to note? Uh, Paul and Diana. Okay, thank you. Anything else on three, four? Top of page four, Chair, a response from the um, Minister, the, the Agriculture Minister. This was regarding the Rural Needs Act and the Minister recognising that there's scope for more to be done and officials are now considering the best approach for that to be brought forward and no doubt we'll be contacted in due course. Okay. And can I have a proposal and seconder, please? Uh, Stephen uh, and Anne-Marie Fitzgerald. Okay. Anything else on four? Sorry, Chair, just at the bottom of that page, then a further response from um, our service, but DERA in relation to the request of the breakdown of information. You remember we had asked about acronyms and also the um, chief executive's attendance at Inishkeen House. So the, the, the details or the abbreviations are all included and the information in terms of the days per year the chief executive is at Inishkeen House is not held by the department. Okay, Seamus. Um, if I was being facetious, I'd say maybe the, they're not held because there is none, but I don't know, uh, nor neither do they. By the uh, sounds of it, so uh, it's uh, it's a bit worrying that uh, Forest Service headquarters uh, was decentralised to Fermanagh and I think seven years later, uh, the top brass in Forest Service hasn't took up residence in the headquarters yet. I think it's a very poor showing from uh, the top civil service because that wasn't the spirit. What <clears throat> that wasn't the spirit of what was supposed to happen. It was supposed to decentralise uh, these uh, jobs, uh, both the the very top uh, management uh, right through Forest Service and it looks as if uh, everyone here till it except the top ma management which is pretty poor from them and it goes to show you maybe the leadership uh, you have to question it. Are you happy to uh, propose the note in Seamus? Thank you and have a seconder. Uh, Glenn, thank you. Okay, anything else? Page five. Chair, just at the bottom of page five, a response from DFI Roads, and this is in relation to the faded road markings um, and concerns regarding those. So basically, the onus is on uh, road users uh, to be diligent and uh, road service will robustly challenge uh, in the event of claims against them that they perceive to be at no fault of DFI Roads. Seamus? Yeah, again, uh, an extraordinary poor response when um, we have roundabouts that are invisible. Uh, I'll give the example of uh, in Brookborough, there's a mini roundabout. There is no visible markings whatsoever. It's a free for all. Uh, we have uh, right handed turning lanes of the F4 uh, 
have vanished, uh, no sight of them at all. And then for a uh, road service to say, you know, that it's up to the user to uh, be careful or to look out for, look out for what? Uh, the, the, they're literally not there and that they defend them vigorously. Maybe if they'd uh, put pressure on and maybe get these, um, uh, at least the, the really priority ones like roundabouts and road junctions uh, got painted, maybe they could vigorously do that and it might suit them better. Okay, are you prepared to know, Chemis? Thank you. Diana? Yes, and um, I would back what Councillor uh, Green has said. I'm, I'm just looking actually at paragraph three um, of the response. Um, the department may be liable for claims involving road markings under common law negligence, but only, only if negligence is proven. But um, it is negligent not to have these lines painted for health and safety on the roads. And, you know, I know there'd be illegal arguments of which department this is, but um, I propose that we go back to the Ministry for Infrastructure and in the grand scheme of things, the road painting scheme, the road marking scheme is not um, an overly expensive scheme compared to what's needed in road surfacing. But in terms of, of lives saved by good road markings, I propose that we, we pursue this further with the Minister to see if we can have a programme for the rural areas and for Mana and Oma in particular that, that are showing those signs of neglect and negligence. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Are you willing to note the second a noting? Okay. Thank you. And uh, Keith? As well, I'll second that proposal there. Okay. As we know, we talked about the, you know, the faded lanes. It's also a big issue with the uh, learner drivers. So what is, uh, especially in round towns and that, you know, with cutting across, you know, for for lanes and moving across and things like that. So it is something that really needs to be really needs to be looked at. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Keith. And Alan? Just to report, Chair, that uh, they are active in in the uh, Fermano Oma area at the minute on, on the A5 today. Uh, so perhaps they are uh, uh, moving into the area. If there's any way that we could capture them and keep them there until they get into yeah. some, some of this work done, well, that would be good. That would be uh, <laughs> but they're, very good. They're already working on the ground. Okay. Very effectively. That's good to hear, but uh, it wouldn't do any harm if there was more of them working on the ground. Uh, so are we all agreed uh, with Diana's proposal seconded by Keith? Okay, thank you. Okay, moving to page six. Mr. Chair, just at the, t sorry, at the top of page six, just a response from the Infrastructure Minister regarding the Enniskillen Southern Bypass. So um, positive on a number of fronts here, Chair. Members will recall we had um, discussions at the last meeting regarding the growth deal funding. So in summary, the, the between the Minister for Infrastructure and Minister for Finance have agreed the early release of the growth deal funding to allow the scheme to proceed to procurement. And also the executive uh, has matched the lost new decade, new approach funding, which means that the original uh, funding for the digital and innovation pillar within the Mid-Southwest growth deal uh, remains intact. Okay. Thanks, Alison. Good news there. So, Josephine? Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, uh, yes, definitely. Uh, good news, Chair. I had actually wanted to come in uh, on item 4.9, the Strudel Shared Education Campus on page six, but um, I, I do want to welcome uh, this correspondence from the Minister and propose to note it. I think it is good news, Chair. Thank you. Okay. But if other members want to comment on that, and then if I could yeah. come in on item 4.9, please. Thank you. It's okay. I keep your mind, Josephine. Uh, Barry? Yeah, I'm 4.9 as well, Chair. Okay. Um, let me just get you here, Josephine Barry. Okay. Uh, Dermot? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, happy to second the note of that correspondence from the Minister. I think it's a hugely positive development uh, that the A4 bypass will, will go ahead and in the skill and now. Um, that that project has been delayed a long time now, and people were wondering would we ever get that bypass delivered. Um, I think when Conor Murphy came into the office of economy, he stated very clearly that regional development was going to be a priority for him, and I think the delivery of the A4 and the Skillen bypass shows uh, the delivery of that commitment. Um, so very positive outcome for Skillen and County from as a whole. 
And it's just a shame that the last two years there was no minister in place to make such a vital intervention. But we were there now anyway. So thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Dermot. And uh, I suppose uh, from my point of view, uh, it's very welcome news that uh, this, as uh, Dermot says, long awaited scheme is going to uh, get a momentum and to actually we're seeing uh, work already, pre preparatory work taking place and, and going to see more work hopefully over the next period of time leading to the uh, construction of it. And while that is very welcome, I suppose we have to be very conscious that um, we're in Fermanagh, one of the only counties that has uh, no motorway and a tiny little bit of dual carriage way. And that could be remedied if we had some dual carriage way from Ballygolly down. And I think to make access into uh, Fermanagh much more readily for business, for tourism, for everything. Uh, certainly the dual in from Ballygolly down uh, would be a, a welcome boost for us. So we are going to move on to our next piece of uh, correspondence, which is 4.9 there. And Josephine. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, Chair, um, we, we had a very valuable meeting on Thursday of last week in Arvely School and Resource Centre, and I do want to thank Mr. Gray, the principal, for hosting us. Chair, it is such a fabulous facility, and it really augurs well for what can be achieved on that site. It was a very well attended meeting. Uh, lots of educationalists, Board of Governors members, and our local MP, MLAs, and politicians. So, uh, 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 that's very, very gratifying to see the interest that was there and overwhelming, uh, in an overwhelming manner, positive for the development of that project. Um, I have to pay tribute to all the school principals who spoke in favour of the project, but especially the pupils of all the schools who are absolutely outstanding and uh, really a great credit and really spoke of their desire to see this project going forward. Mr. McConnell, the principal of CBS, asks, asks for the political representatives to be their voice to progress this project. And uh, I know that this council will be that voice. So with that in mind, Chair, I would like to propose uh, that we now write uh, to, uh, again, to the minister, uh, the uh, deputy first minister and all the executive members um, informing them of the overwhelming support for that project to go ahead and the considerable benefits that it will bring to not just to the education of our uh, children. Just to make you aware, we've already done that. Yes, yes, I'm aware of that, Chair. Um, but um, I think we have been informed uh, by Mr. Brown that we have to make our case for why that project needs to go ahead. And I think that meeting really did uh, uh, demonstrate that. And I really feel that it is definitely in view of that meeting, it is important for us to write again, uh, uh, asking for that support and informing of the positive community support that is for that project, Chair. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Josephine. Can we do that six months? Josephine, we have an issue of doing that within six months of doing it before the last meeting, in fact. Chair, Chair, uh, thank you uh, for giving and it's some not more that time. I'm to... trying to block it. No, no I, I understand. I'm just, I'm just trying to point out why this is different. When we met with Dr. Brown, uh, he said that the impetus was on our community to refute what was in uh, the independent report, uh, demonstrating how that campus not only can de uh, deliver high quality education, but also contribute. Uh, to societal change, reconciliation, building for the future, community provision. And at that meeting, which we, which we uh, uh, enjoyed last Thursday, that was amply demonstrated. Mr. Brown, Dr. Brown did make it clear to us it will be a political decision. We have to inform 
members of the executive who will be making that decision and you know mindful of the competing demands for funding uh, I, I feel it is important that all everyone around the executive table knows the importance of the project that the what it can deliver for our community and the strength of public feeling uh, in support of uh, the Struhl Shared Education Campus. So it's really on foot of that and to demonstrate the benefits and the public support for it that I would ask that we should write again. Okay, Thank thanks, you. George. I'm going to bring Alison in at this point. Thank you, Chair. Chair, it's it's really just by way of a suggestion, and I'm mindful we do have um, correspondence later on the agenda as well from the, the Finance Minister in, in this regard. Um, so the council adopted quite a comprehensive motion at last month's meeting and we also in the context uh, of the programme for government motion did write also regarding the Struhl campus. Um, the Minister of Finance and her correspondence to the council references the fact that the, and this was mentioned by Dr Brown in his meeting with the council, that the departmental officials are working on the full business case to enable the department to take a decision. So there, there would potentially be an action around maybe um, recognising the success of last Thursday evening's meeting, but also maybe urging the education minister to take an early decision on the full funding package for the Struhl campus to be brought forward. George Feeney, are you happy enough that that could be the well, question. Chair. Yes, yes. I'm always happy to to take the chief ad, uh, executive's advice. Um, you know, I am conscious, though, that the decision will be taken by all the executive ministers. Um, and and um, on speaking to Dr. Brown on Thursday night, he assures me he has already assured us of the support of the department uh, in relation to this project. Uh, and he has also assured me of the support of the minister, which is a good good thing to know. And we already know that the first minister is supportive of this project, but we need to get the other executive ministers uh, really fully informed of what this project means to our community. And I suppose that that is the that's the sentiment of my of my motion, Chair. Yeah, I'm thank you. You know, on the bottom of the of the correspondence that we did get back, it says refer to the education minister in yes. the first instance. Yes, yes. Uh, could do uh, that. Yeah. Well, I think it's important that we 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 have to be the mouthpiece for our community, yeah, yeah. and we yep. have to do everything that we can. And I know that we we can and will promote it individually, but collectively as a council. We need to be extremely proactive in this regard. No, nope. thank you. That's great. Thank you, Barry. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, again, I want to commend our own Council Vice Chair on this occasion, uh, Anne Marie Donnelly, who was very uh, involved in promoting this meeting, and thank the Chief Executive for attending as well. Uh, Anne Marie and and uh, Alison's attendance was very valuable too. Um, Outlined on the evening were the educational, social and economic uh, advantages of the project uh, reaching fruition, coming to realisation and uh, particularly the educational achievements that it will bring, you know, the raising of the of the educational attainment levels. Um, great to hear the young people uh, so committed to the project as well. And it was good to see Mark Brown in attendance. Um, senior EA people as well, um, and I took the form of key, keynote addresses at the first part of the meeting and then networking in the second part of the, the meeting. Again, you know, uh, I'm wondering as to what the most effective way to go forward is. You know, our voice is being heard, but we're renewing that voice. Personally speaking, I think the, the most relevant ministers are the, the executive office ministers and the uh, finance minister and of course the education minister those are your real if there was a, a dartboard and a concentric circle of lobbying your bullseye is the education minister here and your your 25 are the ministers coming coming away from education but education is the key minister here to advance this so um, i'm happy to second uh, josephine's proposal 
you know, just to, to move things forward. Uh, but it's good to see holding the vision. And when people get despondent and think something's not going to happen, I think we should remember a lot has already happened in relation to this through campus. Like, for example, the construction of the Strathroy Link Road is all about the campus. So uh, this is too big to be given up on, and we just need to keep that momentum going. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Barry. And Earl? Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, I'll take on board what uh, our Chief Executive has said, but I do support uh, Councillor Dehan's uh, proposal with, re with regard to this, as I was also there in attendance on Thursday evening. A real positive and constructive evening it was. Uh, you know, with Dr. Mark Brown there, you know, for the permanent secretary, uh, this Councillor McAdoff referred to all our senior EA representatives, uh, Department of Education people, but the the principals, the governors, and also the pupils from all schools speaking was very, very positive. And it's something that should unite this community in its total. And uh, the emphasis seems to be this evening on the education minister, quite rightly so. But he has issued a statement uh, about two weeks ago saying he was fully supportive of it. And it's going to take the full executive, probably discussed it in the evening in the network session, that it's going to take all executive ministers to be on board with us. So, uh, you know, we were there and, and there are plentiful numbers all the evening. So I would like to think that's going to happen. But I'm happy enough to second or support Councillor Dean uh, and her and her uh, remarks there as well as Councillor McAdoff. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Earl and Marie. Thank you, Chair. And I just want to come in again to say it was an excellent evening. I think everyone that was there could see that there was a very united front there from the council, from the schools, from even the people there from the education authority. It was. It was apparent that this is something that everybody wants to happen, and it's important that it happens. I'm happy to support Josephine's sentiments in terms of the way forward uh, with assistance from Alison. But I do think it's important maybe that we acknowledge each of the schools and all the effort they put into the evening. There was a huge amount of effort went into that. The principals all spoke really well, and but the pupils, they spoke really from the heart about what it means to them, this project. And I think it would be beneficial and I think important that we write to each of the principals as well to acknowledge their efforts, but also to let them know that us as a council, full cross party support is here for the project. So I think it'd be important to acknowledge everything they've done on the night and to affirm our support for that. Okay. So I'm happy to propose that. Thank you, Anne Marie. Your second in there. Are we all agreed on that, members? I think it's a very good idea. Seamus? Thank you, Chair, and uh, I want to support all the previous comments. Uh, maybe if the Chair would give me a slight bit of latitude, it's on the shared campus as well, but it's one in Fermanagh. Uh, one close to my heart is the one in uh, Broopra, where Broopra controlled primary school and St Mary's uh, primary school in Broopra have been working for the last... Um, 11 years on a shared campus. Uh, a business case was sent uh, four years ago. It still hasn't been completed. I have no idea what has been going on with uh, in the background of why there was so m many delays on it. It made no sense. But now uh, what has uh, transpired is that the Secretary of State has removed £150 million pound ring fenced as far as I was aware of fresh start money that was part of a 500 million pound package for shared campuses and integrated schools. Uh, there is 150 million of it left. The, the school in Broopra was the only uh, primary school across the north that was at this uh, stage uh, ready should have been built uh, apart from whatever delays in departments and bureaucracy. Uh, everything was, was signed and sealed four years ago uh, to go away for business case. Four years later, 
we have been left now with the Secretary of State uh, claiming to have given £3.2 billion pound to the executive, uh, when in actual fact he hasn't. He he uh, robbed the piggy bank and took £150 million that was already there for these projects and uh, packaged it up and let on it was new money. Well, it wasn't new money. Um, uh, the parents and uh, pupils of this school, of these schools, had put in uh, vast amounts of work. Uh, and not only did that shared uh, culture happen um, when over the last 11 years, uh, we were actually sharing classes and sharing stuff when I was at uh, St Mary's Primary School, which is a lot more than 11 years ago. And uh, so we were one of the, the front runners on this. We, um, the Board of Governors and uh, the Headmaster and uh, one of the Headmasters uh, that was one of the instigators of this, um, Sam Blair, Blair uh, actually passed away uh, there uh, during the week, who uh, had put, again, a uh, vast amount of works into this. Uh, uh, and I would like to send my condolences to, to his widow, Ruth. Uh, but all of this work was put in, and now uh, would they have basically abandoned us. They're saying that come, the money could come out of some other pot. Well, I don't know where the other pot is. Uh, it doesn't seem to, to make any sense what has happened. And I, I think we need to write to the Secretary of State, and we need to, to make it clear that trying to uh, trying to uh, cod people and let on new money has been introduced when it hasn't uh, while uh, robbing the, the fund that was for shared and integrated education I think is pretty despicable and I think this council needs to make it very clear that it, uh, that it feels that it's despicable and I would like a very robust letter uh, wrote to the Secretary of State and I would also then like another letter wrote to the executive office and uh, with other relevant ministers uh, asking for support that uh, these last 10 uh, projects will be uh, completed and that children and parents will not be uh, left in the lurch the way they have been. Okay, thanks Seamus. And Victor? Thank you, Chair. I'll second uh, those proposals. Um, I know certainly the people of Brookborough uh, were quite excited about the prospect of this uh, shared campus for the two primary schools, and I know certainly that the two um, primary schools do work very well together. Um, so unfortunately, it's just another uh, another uh, situation where the money has been pulled. I read about it the other day. Um, and certainly will be a lot of disappointments uh, people in that area, no less the Board of Governors of both schools. I can't obviously speak for St Mary's, but I, can, uh, I know certainly that the, the control primary um, was very was very pro going forward in this. And the headmaster's name, Seamus, just for correction, was Sam Blair. That's what he said. But uh, thank you, Victor. Uh, are we all in agreement with uh, Seamus's proposal on those two proposals seconded by Victor? Yeah. Okay. And Stephen? Uh, yeah, Chair. I suppose just because the proposal in 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 encapsulated uh, all tel 10 schools that have been affected, I'll just have to declare an interest as a member of the Board of Governors at Drumran Integrated College as they're one of the schools who's been uh, impacted by the withdrawal of funding. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. And so the only other proposal is Josephine's that uh, has been seconded here so that we're just clear that in the context of the meeting of the other night, we're writing to the education minister to uh, look that the, that the minister uh, would pursue this and uh, look for a, a decision. Alison? No, that's right, Chair. And also just to remind members we have, as per the motion last month, we've already written to the First and Deputy First Ministers uh, and the Education Minister and the Finance Minister requesting a meeting specifically on the Struel campus. Um, so that's already in, in the system for consideration. And, and Chair, if I could maybe just 
highlight we do have a just um, a formal response from the executive office for the apologies for the first and deputy first minister for last Thursday night. Just for noting, just please. to note that. Okay, so um, first of all, are we all agreed on Josephine's proposal, seconded by Barry? Okay, all agreed there. Can I have a proposal seconder just to note the correspondence of apologies from the first and deputy first? Uh, Rushing is proposed and uh, Alan is seconding. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to go to uh, page seven. Page eight. Sorry. Page, page seven. Page seven, yeah. Sorry, right, Chair, just on page seven. Um, two letters, one from Apex and the other a more substantive response from the housing executive. And that was in relation to the, the motion regarding the growing levels of housing stress within the council district. Okay, thanks Alison. Can I have a proposal and seconder to note both of those correspondence? Uh, Shirley, thank you. And Stephen Donnelly, thank you. And moving on to page eight. All right. If I had a matter for Apex, uh, would Hold it be on. appropriate to raise it? Seek your <coughs> judgment, Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Barry. Okay, thank you. Um, Apex and other housing associations uh, are willing to help help us with a project in OMA, uh, which I've raised previously. Um, there's a housing associations advisory group, and uh, I attend uh, the meetings and it's about the workhouse memorial. So I have a proposal because um, at the next meeting, they'll want an update as well. Their willingness to step in to help. Um, and it is that we write to the Department of Health, um, should that be the minister or the minister's private office, just to see if they can move, expedite more quickly uh, a land transaction with the Western Health Trust to enable the Workhouse Memorial to be placed there. Uh, I don't anticipate, you know, hurdles or objections, but it's in the system a number of months. And uh, if that could be expedited with, without delay, it would allow us to progress to the next stage of funding and uh, locating that Workhouse Memorial. Thank you, Chair, okay. for your latitude there. Okay. It seems to be why it doesn't come up in the system. Seamus? Uh, no, I was coming in on yet on the yeah. next item. So, oh, Are you in a mind to... Uh, yeah, I'll, I can second Barry's proposal there. That'll be good. And are we all agreed there, members? Okay, so uh, we're going to uh, page eight. Mr Chair, so it's just to draw attention um, to a couple of items of correspondence that have been received from SSE, Click Energy and Power NI, all of which are indicating the subvention support scheme closed as of June the 23rd and final auditing was completed in, in the autumn. Um, for maybe we'll just, members, pause just for a couple of minutes. We've a difficulty the mics aren't indicating uh, for us. So if we could just maybe propose and say just a recess for five minutes, yeah. if that's okay, please, Chair. Good idea. Okay. See, you see. Really, um, Councillor Thompson, just just pause, Councillor Thompson. Well, should my mic move up there? Well, that happy. It's okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Strange. I'm sorry. You can't see any of the green lights on. No, you can't see any lights on. You can't. That's strange. It marks as a flash. And these supplies are all flashing there. They're even. No. What has gone wrong? Broken? Broke it? Yeah. Oh, maybe just three bullets. It might have just froze. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it just looks like it's froze. So, uh, yes, it's. So, one, a reboot, I'll just. Even the keyboard's gone. Opportunity. Good opportunity, yes. Right, there we go now. Back in business? Yeah, I think it just froze. The application just froze. 
So are you able to work with me? Okay, thanks, Admiral Davies. Uh, no, still laughing. Um, sorry, hasn't. You see, if you look, see the way Stephen's mic is indicating down there, and we're not seeing it here. You see, just pull off your mic. The chart. Order, yeah. Okay, members, if you'd like to resume your seats, we'll. Uh... The energy bill supports being a Did we? We had that with all of the proposing and things. It was like having started to accommodate just an energy bill for so it's over the shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he'll, he'll be your first one in. Okay. Okay, members. So, uh, Seamus, you were about to speak on this issue, which is uh, page eight. Uh, yeah, and again, I forgot there what what I was going to speak on. So, um, yeah, it was on these um, on uh, these letters that came back. It uh, it's all very confusing. I don't know uh, what the chief executive thinks what the best move now because the the last letter we got from the uh, the British government minister stated uh, seemed to say to go back to the to the energy companies. We've went back to the energy companies and they have said that the scheme is closed and that the, the audit has been done. So 
do we go back and make that clear to the the, the government minister that they should the uh, the original letter that seemed to indicate that this scheme wasn't closed and uh, maybe report back of what the energy companies are saying. Um, uh, I would propose something like that, but I'd like to hear what the chief executive thinks of them letters and, and the previous letter then together because they're very contradictory. Okay, thanks, Seamus. Oh, I, I, Chair, I, do, I would agree. I think certainly the previous correspondence we'd had from the minister did give an indication that there was some flexibility and that particularly for those um, residents in the district who hadn't been able to avail of the scheme for whatever reason, these are certainly from each of the suppliers and we've written to others are very definitive. So I would have thought really our only course of action now can be to go back again to the government department and closing copies of these letters and then clarifying if if there are those people still within the district who for whatever reason were unable to benefit, how then they access this funding given that the, each of the energy companies have said there is no ability for them to pay out. Uh, can I propose that then, uh, Chair? Okay, proposed by Sheminis. Moving to Mark. Thank you, Chair. Happy to second that proposal, Chair. It's just it's just really going back to a point on page seven and to declare an interest on the proposal from Councillor McLeodoff about writing to the private private office within the Department of Health. And then, from memory, I think there was a proposal earlier in the meeting as well about writing to the Minister again about a women's health strategy. So it's just to declare reg or register an interest in both of those. Okay. Are we all agreed with Seamus's proposal seconded by Mark there? Uh, did we write back and uh, see if we can get any further clarification in closing the copies of the uh, correspondence? Okay. Thanks, members. Okay. Anything else on it? Nine. Mark. Thank you, Chair. And it was in relation to the debate or a few remarks that I had made at last month's meeting in relation to the disruption to waste management, both in terms of the collection of food caddies as well as disruption to um, the opening hours of household recycling centres. And I appreciate that this is a report was requested and it is going to be considered at an upcoming committee meeting. But just before tonight's meeting, I, I read that committee report and I still don't think, Chair, having been in the meeting and haven't spoke on it at last month, I still don't think that report that's going to the committee now in the coming days provides the assurances that we as members requested then. Um, and, I, and looking at it, I mean, even in the last few days alone, Chair, I have seen, and I'm sure all of us, we're all getting the same emails about the daily notifications about what routes were missed or what collections were missed on what route. And then even in the last few days alone, I, I've just had a quick look. And Drummy, Garson, Tempo, and I think it was Carrigmore and Drumore were all disrupted in terms of opening hours. And and that, that it's just re reiterating the point again, Chair, that the committee report isn't effectively good enough, in my opinion, because it doesn't provide the assurance or e even the recognition that it is being treated with the with the priority that it deserves. And just in relation to the minutes, Chair, um, I know on the proposal of my colleague, Councillor Diane Armstrong, last month that we or she had proposed that the council issued communication to all the rip or to all the households within the council. And I appreciate we did get an email at the end of last week that that had happened. I mean, I have two points in that. Firstly, that communication was requested on the 6th of February. It didn't issue, as far as I know, until the 1st of, 1st of March. So it's just a general observation and it's within council and it's within committees and it's within subcommittees. Not everything within the council has to be left the last minute before it's going to be considered at the upcoming meeting. So that, that was the first point. And then the second point was, I mean, I, I have a copy of the communication here and it was a press release really. I mean, it's fine. It doesn't really say anything, but it's, so it's fairly bland and it's fairly factual, but it's the lines that we've been using all year. But the, the one thing that's really missing from this communication is a time frame in terms of when things are going to get better. Because I don't see it. I've I read it and I read it again and I've read the committee report. I think it's tomorrow night's committee report. I don't see a time frame in terms of when things are going to get better. Because as I say, Chair, things, in my opinion, things are as bad now, if not worse, than they were this time last month. Thank you. Okay. Can I have a proposal then in sector for the to note the correspondence here? Oh, we're all up to date here on that. Okay. Nothing else on nine, 10, 11, 10, 
Are you looking in on 10, Barry? Um, I'm looking in on item 8-1. I'm just wondering, um, ahead of the next health and social care services meeting, when does the call go out for um, items for the agenda? You know, that would be discussed at that. Sorry, Chair. So that meeting is next week and it was agreed with the trust we'd keep the same agenda. But certainly if there are any specific issues that members wish to alert me in advance, I would just at their soonest convenience. Okay. I think the document or the paper issues on Thursday would be the date for the for the okay. agenda itself. I have one item. Do you want it now or tomorrow in writing? Well, in writing would be helpful, I'll Chair. Do that that's tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Okay. You're happy enough there, Barry? Victor? A wee bit of latitude, please, Chair. Um, just on the Health Committee, uh, I want to inform that uh, Councillor Diana Armstrong will be replacing um, Councillor Mark Ovens. Thank you. Okay, Julie noted, Victor. Okay, anything else on 10, 11? Chair, on Page 11, and this is correspondence in your, it's the second item in your other folder. It's a response from the minister. Um, it's in relation to a couple of the letters, but um, specifically the minister has indicated his willingness to meet with the council and um, he, his diary secretary will be in touch in due course. We haven't uh, received any details as yet as to when that meeting will be. Okay, thanks, Alison. Do we need... Just a proposal and second to note the correspondence, Stephen Donnelly and Victor. Thank you. <laughs> okay, anything else on 11? 12? 13? 16? 17, 18. Sorry, Chair, just on 18, and it says specifically in relation to the Struel, the motion on Struel. And I appreciate we did discuss this earlier in the meeting, but just to note the correspondence from Dr. Archibald, the Minister of Finance, referring us to the Education Minister, should we have any future inquiries regarding the Struel project. And we have already noted that. So, so we haven't shared it. Oh, no, it was the, yeah. So, can I have a proposal second? Alan, thank you. And a seconder to note, uh, Anne Marie Fitzgerald, thank you. Okay, anything else on 18, 19? So, Chair, just on 19, we have a series of letters from the, the motion that was adopted on the program for government. So firstly, from the Ulster Unionist Party, uh, then from the Minister for the Economy, from the Minister of Justice, the Minister for Infrastructure, and uh, in the received today, the Minister of Finance, and that is the other uh, correspondence item five. So they all relate to the motion and in, in various degrees, Chair referred to the fact the programme for government has not yet, the negotiations have not yet commenced, but a commitment to continue to work with the Council and other councils in ensuring it uh, meets the priorities for the for the wider region. Thanks, Alison. Anthony? Yeah, thanks, Chair. And I'd just like to, to welcome these positive letters that we received from the four that you mentioned there, Alison. And it's great to see the pos positivity in the letters when they were play and um, that the, the, some of the highlighted some of the um, motion, the, the jobs that we mentioned in it there. And um, good to see the Inniskillen Bypass um, already started or talk of it started. So I'm um, just like to propose a note of it. I must... Okay. Thanks, Anthony. Seamus? Uh, yeah, I would uh, just like to. Uh, welcome all the letters that came in in response of the motion. Uh, delighted to see, and uh, hopefully uh, they won't forget about us when they get the length of that round table to uh, discuss their program for government. And are you willing to uh, second the noting, Seamus? Thank you. We all agreed, members. Barry, I just want to commend Councillor Green for surfacing that initiative because. Of the 11 councils in the north, it's my guess 
that only one, only one has sent to the executive ministers their list of priorities for possible inclusion in a programme for government. It was a good exercise and it was well done. Thank you. Yeah, it's always good to get our uh, views onto the tables of uh, the people making the decisions. OK, moving along to page 20. It's on page 20, Chair, correspondence from the Prudential Regulation Authority, and this is in relation to the um, increase in premiums and really the, I suppose, the last paragraph on page one advises that the increase in home and motor insurance premiums is largely because of the costs of settling claims has also increased significantly. Roy? Chair, yeah, I had a, recently had a conversation with uh, an insurance uh, provider and uh, highlighted these concerns that Councillor Green had brought forward. Now, uh, basically, they assured me that uh, with regards to um, the rising costs of PR um, premiums, or um, basically that there's car parts when a car is damaged and it goes in for repair in a car body shop, it's the parts that's the problem. There's a long time waiting list for those to come, whether they're stuck in, in uh, container ships or whatever. Um, and with the result of that, then it's the what is actually putting up their premiums is the car hire uh, firms are um, pushing up the premium of their charges. Um, and unfortunately, it's the customers then have to pick up the, uh, the, the brunt of it. So I suppose I would propose that maybe if we could write a letter to the hire care companies expressing a regulator um, within that and see if uh, get an explanation to see why, why is that the case. Thank okay, you, and Roy, are you happy to note the correspondence? I am indeed. Okay, thank, thank you. you and Stephen? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, happy to second the noting of the correspondence from the from the PRA. Uh, I suppose there's nothing really of value I found in this letter. Uh, the crux of my proposal last month was to, was to investigate to make sure that consumers were not being ripped off. Chairman, you know, to make sure that somebody is investigating or, or regulating uh, these insurance companies. Yes, we all accept that there's there's rises in claims, not uh, incurs costs, but who's to make sure that consumers aren't aren't being uh, ripped off and getting the best value for money? So there's nothing much in this letter that that addresses that point. Uh, we are waiting for correspondence. I think Chairman to come back in from the AFCA, uh, that hasn't arrived in yet. I'm sure. Okay, no. So probably wait to see what that says. I think they have got more of a role in terms of consumer protection. So there might be something of value in that. But since I brought this to the chamber last month, Chairman has been uh, several people in touch, you know, with with their own stories. And one fella, three hundred and thirteen percent of an increase in his insurance renewal. A uh, a young student I was talking to is paying more per month for her car insurance than she is for her rent. You know, uh, and I just noticed that whenever I was looking into this, there was a survey carried out last year from Compare NA, one of the comparison websites, and they uncovered that twenty five percent of all drivers have reconsidered driving at all due to the cost of car insurance. I think that's a, a massive uh, uh, fact there or statistic, you know, and that's okay if you live in Belfast or Derry or any of these big big cities or towns, but in Mananoma, with the huge rural area that we have, you know, we, we, we need our cars, you know, we don't have the luxury of a, of a regular public transport uh, system or network, so this is a real, real issue for, for people out there. Uh, the continuing trend of insurance premiums rising should be a huge concern to us all, and uh, we should be doing all that we can, I suppose, to ensure that consumers are getting the best value for money. Yes, we appreciate that the that the cost of insurance uh, or cost of claims and the regulatory or the, the frequency of claims is having an impact, but who's who's to make sure that 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 we're, that they're getting the best value for money? So I suppose, Chairman, we'll hold out and see what the FCA come back with, but. Uh, Definitely looking forward to see what they say. In terms of house insurance, so we heard uh, Roy, and that's a welcome conversation that Roy's had with, with an insurance industry person, but house insurance claims is also through the roof as well. So they can't blame parts or important parts for that. You know, health insurance is up. So so uh, th there's a lot of questions around, around them and disease as well. So that's what that's me, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Anthony? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I don't know what, what was on the proposal second, but I second them if there weren't. Yeah, yeah, just want to come and briefly on this too. It's been a major issue. And since last month, as well as Steve, the two other parents has got on to me with their, with their sons and daughters after 
passed the test and quoted 4,000 and 4,200. Like, serious price for the car, as much the same as paying, paying a mortgage. And I was um, I was chatting and the insurance broker was, was told exactly the same as what I was told there as well. So it's desperate. And house insurance, as Steve is saying, everything else, and agriculture insurance for farms has gone up to the roof as well. So I just um, as Steve, look forward to the next debt that we get back and hopefully try and get something solved out of it. Thank you. Okay. Seamus? Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, something I, I have raised previously on that, and I'm not sure whether we wrote a letter on it or not, but on the back of what uh, Stevie's uh, motion and the reaction on it, uh, these insurance companies are saying they're putting up the prices because costs are going up. But when they're putting up the price of house insurance, of farm insurance, of car insurance, of but we'll say your house insurance, they're not putting up what the house is covered for. We'll say your house is covered for 150000 and they double your insurance. Well, they're not putting up the cost to 300000 So they're, they're, it's a false uh, uh, argument they're making that, they're, they're, that it's because of cost, because they are only going to pay out on the value of, of uh, you have on your property. So I don't know how they can justify that. And I, I would like that we would write uh, either to the regulator or what to clarify that, that can insurance companies add to their, uh, double their costs or add whatever 20, 30 percent to the cost without actually adding uh, to the value of your property by the equivalent sum? Because if inflation goes up one way, it goes up the, the, the other way. But it, it works both ways. Um, the other thing I just wanted to bring up, um, uh, I have uh, was contacted by uh, somebody who uh, was in a quite a a minor accident, and uh, the insurance company has uh, because they had like a cosmetic type of a, a, a silver thing pushed onto their their exhaust of their car. This was a young person, and uh, I think they bought the car uh, like that. The insurance company has now rescinded their, their insurance. They can't get insurance for three years now from any insurance company, and um, they won't cover the, the, the accident. And they reckon that 52% of people that has insurance doesn't know that. If you put a tint on your back win windows, if you put a tint... Uh, uh, if you modify your car in any way, the insurance companies now are are uh, rescinding your insurance, and you will not get insured when they do it. So I think we should um, uh, we should be trying to highlight that. I think the particular case I'm talking about is just completely unfair. It's just the the insurance company trying to get out of uh, of uh, paying for an accident and. Uh, these insurance companies, I think, are, uh, I don't want to say too much, but they're, they're, they're bothering on, on uh, uh, shifty enough practices at the minute. Uh, and I know in the South, they have been reeled in, but there doesn't seem to be the same, the same thing uh, in the North. And I'm glad that Stevie brought this motion because I think we do really need to keep highlighting this. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that they're letting on uh, the likes of increasing premiums, but not increasing costs. All of it needs to be questioned. And the regulator, we really need to be putting pressure on the regulator to actually uh, look into these things. OK, thanks, Seamus. Are we all agreed on Roy's uh, proposal, seconded by Anthony, that we write to the car hire companies? Uh, no, I got it as Anthony, uh, so I'm going to hold it as Anthony. Uh, so um, there you go, Steve. You missed out on that. Uh, could have been just my way of doing it. I must have. Uh, you clearly didn't bring it to, to get the next one. Okay, uh, and I'm moving on to John now this time. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just want to say that what the insurance companies are doing is shocking, and the insurance, com insurance companies will try to blame others, but... Talking about car parts, I, I know fellas that are working in car parts and own car parts things. 
that they ain't making massive profits every year. But guess who are making massive profits every year? That's insurance companies. I haven't heard tell of an insurance company going out of business in a long, long time. And I know that the people running them are getting massive, massive bonuses every year. That's before the profits were even released. So, uh, and I also know one young fella in, in Edney. He has his car sitting on a st street. It went from 110 pounds a month to 310 pounds a month. That's just crazy. Absolutely. Dermot? Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just thinking, uh, I'm not too sure if we've written to the Competition and Markets Authority at this stage, so just a suggestion, maybe if Councillor McCann was happy enough, we could write to them as well, raising some of the issues which we've discussed there as well, okay? That's why I propose that. No. So Dermot's proposing that. Okay, Dermot. And Stephen? Yes, Chair, I just want to uh, second Shimmis's, Councillor Green's proposal and, and Dermot's, uh, Chair. That's me, you know, Stephen. Second from that, Chair. <laughs> that is duly noted, Stephen, on both. Uh, so we have uh, we have uh, those uh, two. Uh, one to write to the regulator by Seamus, second by Stephen. And uh, to write uh, to... Competitions and Markets Authority. Competitions and Markets Authority by Dermot and seconded by Stephen. Uh, so we all agreed. Okay, thanks, members. And then anything else on page 20, 21? Okay, concludes our minutes. So we'll take the matter saying yes, a special council meeting. And that was the 8th of February, so page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. Chair, just in relation to uh, at the bottom of page nine, there was the discussion regarding the announcement about the BT call centre in Enniskillen and it was requested then that we would write both to BT and to the uh, to Invest Northern Ireland. The in Invest NI responded formally um, and we did, you, you led a delegation chair to meet with the senior officials from Invest including their chief executive and then last Thursday we had a meeting uh, with BT. Earlier today chair I just circulated by email to members there were a number of questions raised at the meeting with BT um, and received a response this afternoon to some of those who so that has also been circulated to you. Okay. Adam. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, just to state uh, what, a, what a terrible position the workers are in this and, and they are really at the heart of the issue um, and we shouldn't forget that. Um, there's people in their lives here and their livelihoods and, and being able to put food on the table, heat the home, heat their homes, pay their bills, uh, who are massively worried and have a, still have a lot of uncertainty. Um, I've attended both the meetings of, of BT staff in, in the Westville Hotel, as have other councillors, such as, as Councillor Roof and Brown and, and Maguire, who have been, and Councillor Armstrong, and, and I th don't want to leave anyone else out there. Uh, there's a few others as well. Um, so. We, we've been definitely all listening uh, and I know I've been speaking to people individually who've contacted me as well. And I think words can, can only do so much uh, in this situation. We do need something real and concrete on the table. You know, and I think um, Connor Murphy, uh, Minister, um, he made a very welcome statement warning BT of reputational damage. I think that's uh, a good step, but it, it needs to really only be the start. Um, ultimately, large companies such as this, such as this, really only care about their their bottom line quite often, uh, and I think this is where Connor Murphy and Invest and I do need need to intervene. Um, what needs to happen, uh, and this is this is from talking to to staff and, and other representatives and, and union is is Con Connor Murphy um, needs to get. CEO, the chief exec of Invest in I, the CEO and relevant board members of BT and EE in a room, uh, and he needs to get them in there together. And with Invest in I, he needs to develop really some sort of package 
could be a grant package or something to incentivize keeping the jobs here. It, it had been the way for many, many years um, that there was packages in place to keep these jobs here and it would be very much within his and Invest in A's remit to do this. Um, and this has been relatively fast moving. The, the situation has very much changed from where we were three weeks ago, as I'm, I'm sure you'd appreciate, Chair. In further to this, Chair, in particular, if such a package wouldn't be accepted, if there was something produced and it wasn't accepted, I do think the Minister needs to consider uh, sanctions against BT on some description. Now, th there's going to be difficulties with it, of course. I I'm no legal expert. Um, but whether it be, if, if feasible, some sort of embargo on Invest in I funding for, for the whole BT company, because the wider company need to be involved, and that's in the union, the wider BT company, not just the EE part, need to be aware of the consequences of this. Uh, maybe something around eligibility for government contracts, but that's that's for the minister and his, his legal advisors to to develop ideas on, really. Might not be feasible, might be legally impossible, but should be at least investigated uh, at this stage. And as every real avenue needs to be explored here. So what I would do, Chair, is I'll just propose that we write to Connor Murphy and the Chief Executive Invest and I uh, and request that they investigate the possibility of packages or grants, uh, looking at previous ones on how to keep the jobs here, and that they then present this to the CEO of, of BT and of EE and relevant board members of said companies, invite them to the table, because I think it's those decision makers. Us as reps, you know, we, we've, I think we've all been dealing with, with Nick Speed and, and some of it had dealings with other members of staff there who say a lot but say nothing, and they're not the real decision makers here, uh, and they need to be brought to the table. Uh, and also uh, in that letter, just to ask Connor Murphy, uh, is he exploring um, the ability to, to look at some sort of sanction or penalty for BT in along the lines of invest in I funding and government contracts? Maybe impossible, but I think the intention of even if he says, I'm looking at it, I think that has a massive impact, whether it's possible or not, the fact that it's being looked at would be very important. Chair, thank you. Okay, thanks, Adam. And I suppose just to bear in mind when we were at the meeting with invest, and uh, I'm not sure if it was Eddie or somebody, I think it was yourself, Eddie, brought up the idea of just, you know, trying to hold BT uh, to uh, tougher sanctions for, and if there was any incentivizing going on. Um, the chief executive, Kieran Donoghue, was very uh, forthright in his views that uh, um, BT. Uh, employs, I think it was 5,000 people or whatever across the rest of the North and that that uh, had to be protected too, uh, notwithstanding or, or saying anything on the 300 jobs in Enniskillen. Eddie? Thanks, Chair. And yes, um, at that meeting with Invest in, I, I think I, I used the term carrot and stick and uh, it was rather uh, resolutely refuted. Um, but it's quite encouraging to hear from the um, from the department and, and from the minister of a, a really a, an opposing a view of that, and, and that they are going to look at um, look at that in the whole. So I, I, do, I do welcome um, the stance from the minister on that. Uh, I think it's it's more robust than perhaps <clears throat> it was initially, and perhaps he was he had a holding answer initially, but before he was it was fully briefed on it. Um, I, th I think. Initially, MLAs across the board were, were relatively slow on the uptake on this. BT were clever with their language, uh, as this was being placed as a review uh, rather than uh, the reality of what it is, which is is a, is a real uh, and acute risk of job loss. <clears throat> but uh, thankfully, due to the, the rapid work of the, the CWU, and I, I would have to say to the, the council itself, uh, with, with quick meetings with both Invest NI and with BT, um, Politicians have been made more acutely aware of the sever severity of this uh, on on the people of Inniskillen and Fermanagh uh, as a wider area. With the Invest in I meeting, I think we all left relatively positive. I feel like Invest in I made it clear that they are working to try and find a resolution. And uh, again, it was it was great that we managed to get a meeting this quickly uh, with the chief executive. And the fact that the chief executive himself was there was also good. Uh, symbol that, that they are taking this very seriously. Uh, myself and a number of other councillors were on that meeting with BT on th on Thursday, the 29th, and uh, safe to say that, that I was I was extremely frustrated on that call. Um, it was 
30 minutes of stalling, of not answering, of dithering. Uh, and it was, I, I call it a masterclass in not answering a question. That's, that's essentially what it was. Um, it was it was incredibly frustrating. There was no cooperation involved whatsoever in that. And uh, it really, um, as as Councillor Armstrong said last night, I still, the, the, the words ring in my ear, but um, um, Tanya, uh, one, of, one of the BT reps, said that her priority was the welfare of uh, the staff which I thought was just a slap on the face for the people who are looking at, at a job loss after 30 years. Uh, it was an embarrassing use of a turn of phrase, to be perfectly honest. Um, but yes, I, I welcome um, Councillor Gannon's letter. I, I would second that. Uh, I think I think it's key to look at. Um, and I, I think that the, the, the minister here has the ability, has the financial backing, and I think he has the backing of every party um, to, to do what's needed to keep those jobs in the skill. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Eddie. Diana? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd just like to support the comments that have been made earlier and, and really to to report that um the interventions by council were appreciated last night. They were they were met, met referenced and um certainly the room did did appreciate that. I mean, um I think the as as Councillor Roof has said, the meeting we had with BT yielded nothing and it was very very frustrating and, and for the employees who we empathize with they have not been getting answers there's been no corporate clarity on anything um i i made a proposal last night for consideration that and and i'm not really sure if it's something that would work but we, we need to look for solutions given that they're going to centralize bt will centralize their sales and their social media operation and their online operation in belfast we have a really excellent workforce in Enniskillen of 300 BT employees, so good that they've been sent to Belfast to train the next cohort. But the employees that are here have regularly outperformed any other district, any other region in the UK, and have been rewarded for that. So my proposal is, is there an option to look at those employees testing innovative and new products being researched and developed by BT? in situ in Enniskillen as an outreach of BT Actual because they are used to, um, with the products that BT hold, they have experience in the products, a very you know, top level experience and where they could be used with their expertise to develop these products, to test market them. Um, is that one solution that can be put forward by the council to the, to the minister as a possible solution and a possible way forward because we need to secure these jobs wherever we can? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Would you be happy enough then that uh, that would be included in Adam's uh, letter to the Minister then in the packages? Okay. Um, then, uh, John. Thank you, Chair. And again, I agree with what all the other councillors are saying. I'm sure most of the chambers are the same. The, the only piece of information that came out of the, the meeting last week between councillors and the BT reps, as far as I can see, that, that, that was new to us was the name of another company, which is Telefonica, who are a global, or I believe it was Telefonica, and, and they, they seem to be some sort of global leaders. I see they have links to Orange in, in other other areas, and, and I'm not sure whether this is correct, but that, and maybe I've got the name wrong, but there's another company involved here, and, and they're not being named at all, and I think think maybe they need to be included in anything that we're doing about BT and EE. This company is also somewhere in there as an actor. Okay, yeah. thanks, John. Ahead, yeah. Chair, it's just to clarify um, in terms of Councillor McCloughry's comments, because yeah, I also thought it was Telefonica, but I've included the correct uh, name in the in the communication just that I sent this evening. It's a Tele Real is is the name of the company, and um, I, I have a, I had asked for for some questions or had asked some questions on behalf of members specifically regarding the relationship between that company and the BT Group. So that's not, uh, at least in my opinion, that's not responded to fully in the answer that has been provided. But so it's it's Tele Tele Real. Okay, John. Uh, thank you, Chair, and yeah, I kind of just want to show support to the, to the proposal made, you know, and Conor Murphy can do anything to put pressure on BT Group, you know, he, he try his best too, but 
I'm just just brought up, you know, last year they made 1.73 billion pounds profit to BD, BD Group. And it just galls me that they take public subsidies the whole time whilst making obscene profits and then could treat their staff in the way they're treating them. Just, 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 just to highlight what kind of people we're dealing with. Okay, thanks, John. Bring Anne Marie in. Thank you, Chair. And just on following on from everyone's comments, I think this is so important in the Fermanagh area, certainly, and I'm sure there's people in the Tyrone district, Roma district too, that are affected. I think that we sh we should request a meeting with the minister to discuss this to see actually a face to face meeting or if it has to be a teams meeting. It's too important this not to speak to him at the highest level and get our points across. So I'd like to propose that on behalf of the BT staff. OK. And Eddie, you want it in again? Yes. Sorry, Chair. Thank you for indulging me. Um, it's just to ask for a meeting with BT themselves again after the closure of the uh, voluntary scheme on the 28th of March. It was pretty clear on Thursday that really didn't want to speak to us before that. Uh, and they wanted that uh, process to finish first. Um, as much as I don't want to speak to them again, uh, I, I think we should arrange the meeting all the same and, and try and get whatever their next steps are so that we can uh, adequately inform um, our constituents and, and the workers uh, of BT. And just to follow on with John's point about the, the profits of BT last year, just to clarify, they made 1.73 billion pre-tax. They actually made 1.9 after tax. They actually made more money after tax because of the subsidies and they've used those subsidies to take jobs away from them skilling. So I think that puts it in stark contrast to what the reality should be in a company that's getting uh, taxpayers' money to, to facilitate their work. Um, but I'm just thinking there, um, certainly the, the meeting with BT, I'm wondering, should we be looking, maybe we can look, but we wouldn't get anybody, but anybody else bar uh, no harm to Tanya and Nick, you know, is there anybody uh, more senior up the pecking order that we could, um, yeah, and the, I'll, I, yeah, we could do that again, looking to see senior uh, people. So, um, Eddie, you've uh, proposed that. Um, have I a seconder for that? Adam, all agreed there. Anne Marie has proposed that we seek a meeting with the minister. Have I a seconder for that? John, really, thank you. Have we all agreed there? Okay, that wraps that, members. And anything else on nine just and ten? Yes, Chair, just on page ten. Uh, at the last, at the council meeting, we'd obviously referred to the amendments to standing orders uh, to allow for hybrid attendance. So just to draw members' attention at this stage to the correspondence that was received on Friday evening from the Department for Communities. And in essence, uh, it means that after tomorrow, we have to revert to full in-person meetings. That will be for council, committee and subcommittee meetings. Um, our understanding is that I think new guidance or sorry regulations are being prepared, uh, but they will take some time uh, for those to be drafted and, and prepared. But there is really no legislative basis now to proceed after uh, tomorrow on a virtual basis. It will also obviously impact on the planning committee in terms of agents and others making representations. So all of those two will be in person from here on. So really just for noting, Chair. Okay. Can I have a proposal? We have Stephen. You Chair, uh, happy to propose an open to that. I'm um, just like with planning uh, over the last number of months, I suppose the agents have got used to having the facility of, of being able to log in maybe from the office. Uh, is there any sort of communication going out from the council to advise this is no longer an option? Conscious of the planning meetings, you know, in, in well, another fortnight, whatever it is. Yep. C certainly, Chair, we will we will do so and we'll get that action from tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, Stephen. Well, Chair, I suppose I just want to put on record my um, deep annoyance at the fact that this actually has been progressed by the minister in this way, not least given that it has given very little advance notice to this council to be able to prepare in terms of what's going to have to happen for the rest of our March meetings. I mean, 
I am someone who is fully supportive of uh, virtual working because I think that it's good to lead by example in terms of that workplace flexibility, making sure that we recognize the particular needs of this district in terms of our rurality, but also in terms of access to the council chamber for those with disabilities, for those who have got uh, parenting commitments, childcare issues that have to be taken into account. And so whilst the minister, I think, has said that uh, in the context of new legislation, it is a door that remains open. I don't think to date he has actually stated a commitment to uh, continuing with it, uh, whatever the time scale. I might be wrong about that, but I think that it would be uh, responsible for us as a local authority to write to the minister to state our uh, dissatisfaction at this decision and to restate our commitment to the continued provision of hybrid and virtual working as a means of ensuring that the Fermanagh Noma District Council and indeed all spheres of local government and indeed all workplaces have the capacity to be inclusive of all people uh, in, in the time ahead. So I'd make that a proposal, Chair. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Adam? Thank you, Chair. And, and you know, when I, when I saw this and I saw it reported on the news as well, I was very deeply disappointed by it, you know. It's kind of a mentality to me that shows that the minister is completely out of touch with modern working. Do you know, he, this is how the world works now. We had COVID, we had development from it, and, and, and this is possibly one of the positives that came out of that was the hybrid working, the hybrid meeting. And it is absolutely, I, I don't see the logic behind it. You know, what planet is he living on that he doesn't realize and see the benefit of this? He is also saying, uh, there that you know he's looking at legislation surely anyone with common sense would prepare the, the next set of legislation and extend the ex the current legislation uh, if they had any intention of keeping it i have no i don't really have faith given the minister's comments that he wants to to get hybrid meeting back I, you know i'd be saying to him he needs to get into the 21st century here um because this this decision is 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 dreadful. Let's think about this even in other terms. Doing this it cuts emissions. People, uh, councillors, are able to sign in. What in cases of weather conditions, as we've had in this council, where there was weather warnings, and we took the decision to go fully hybrid for the safety of councillors and, and importantly staff. And as well as that, it, it helps save ratepayers money. If someone can sign into a meeting rather than claim for fuel because they're entitled to, to claim for fuel if they're driving from Tyrone into in Danaskillen and vice versa from Fermanagh into, into Oma, you know, and, and from across within the two counties to, to each of the, the, the buildings. Uh, and I am totally in support of what Councillor Donnelly has proposed there. I think we need to make sure it's incredibly strongly worded um, and that he needs to bring he needs to extend the current legislation and give a commitment um that he will bring uh hybrid meeting um legislation through i think that does need to be included if it wasn't already to ask him will he commit to extending which i think councillor donnelly has covered but also will he commit to bringing forward hybrid uh meeting legislation um because it just shows completely out of touch with how, how the world works now after after COVID and modern working. Thank you, Chair. And a yes. second, Councillor Donnelly's proposal. Sorry, just to Thank say you, that. Thank you, Adam. Okay, we have uh, Victor. Thank you, Chair. Well, I have to agree with the previous speakers. It's uh, a very short-sighted, uh, very short-sighted recommendation that the Minister has made. Um, not only, and Adam has hit the points, uh, not only is it uh, more cost effective for us to to do our meetings uh, hybrid from home, uh, I think it's very possible, you know, with the exception of this full council meeting, which we're all have all been happy to attend in person, but to be able to do the the smaller committees, which we have now of 18 people, um, they're certainly very controllable uh, by doing them by doing them online. Uh, plus, again, as Adam has said, you know, we're the cost. Um, we're saving money to our ratepayer to the council, and uh, obviously, which is very much in the news all the time, the environment. If we're not using our cars to and from work, uh, to and from our meetings, uh, we're not polluting the air. So I would certainly like to agree with the previous speakers. Thank you. Okay, Dermot. 
Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just to say this is an utterly ridiculous decision by the Minister to allow this provision to collapse while he awaits further legislation down the line, all because he's not in favour of the particular type of legislation, the Coronavirus Act. You know, it's just beggar's belief. It reminds me of, you know, a, a child who's losing at a game and takes the, the, the ball home or something, you know, just <laughs> ridiculous. Are you are you willing in that vein to uh, second the noting of uh, correspondence? Thank you, Dermot. Uh, Okay, so we uh, have Stephen's uh, proposal signed by Adam. Are we all agreed? Uh, before we do that, just bring Alison in. Chair, just maybe if Councillor Gannon was, was minded, I think our understanding from an officer perspective is that the significant work has been undertaken on the drafting of the new legislation. So I think there there is an intent, but I think if we perhaps got clarity on the timescales and the process, because it's unclear at this stage, whether, for example, there would be a formal consultation or other process and what the decision making thereafter will be in the Assembly. I'm certainly happy to pick up on, on the other points made. I think as well, Chair, and I know it's noted in, in the letter, members will recall we have um, routinely brought through the sort of rolling over of the legislation. And I think it's that paragraph setting out the, the Section 78 extension that once the Assembly came into to being, that set the clock essentially for for the continuance of that provision. But I think if we just got clarity on the formal timescale and the process thereafter, that would certainly be helpful. You're happy enough with that, Adam. OK, we all agreed, members. OK, thank you. That concludes the Minister's special council meeting. So we're going on now to um, confirm the minutes of the planning committee held on the 24th of January. So, for accuracy, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen and 17 and Robert it'll propose for me thank you and seconded by Paul thank you matters arising page one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And we're going to consider a report on environmental services, and that was held on the 7th of February. And for accuracy, page 1. Two, three, four, and five. And Debbie is going to propose for me there. And a seconder is Roy. And matters arising. Page one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, Stephen. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And uh, first of all, can I just uh, uh, thank the directors because I know that um, this week, uh, just under six point three, that there is an intention for the street cleansing team to meet with a representative of the Coolnagar Community Association. But um, on six point two, have we had any uh, indication from the department yet as to whether they'd be prepared to meet regarding the situation on the Brookmount Road? John. Chair, I will check. I think we may have had correspondence. So certainly, you know, the correspondence had issued. So I'll just check if, if if the correspondence is in the pack for tomorrow night. I know there's different pieces of correspondence have come in, but I'll come back to the the member on that. Okay, thanks, John. Adam, thank you, Chair. Just top of page five on on, on fly posting. Um, 
No, I, I'm not on environmental service, but I was reading some of, some of the comments that, that were made. And I think it might have been Councillor Donnelly in particular talking about political fly posting being an issue. And, you know, uh, on the back of that, a number of constituents contacted myself because they obviously saw Councillor Donnelly talking about it on this occasion. Um, and, you know, look, the own party has done it and, and does it too. Um, but I do think people are kind of fed up of political posters being up, you know, it's bad enough at, at election time, we all know it. And to be fair to everyone here, you generally, you take down all your, your other, your posters, but there's numerous other political posters up that aren't linked to elections. Uh, and constituents in particular have been asking me about how these can be removed and how these can go about being removed. And I believe in the past there was, it was maybe, I can't remember how long ago, but there was an indication that they would be removed that there'd be kind of a, a general sweep and they would all be removed uh, and I think that had happened in, in the past and obviously there's other posters up from different things that aren't political too. Um, is there any way, maybe the director could, could answer this, is there any way of doing like a sweep of the district uh, and removing these? Is, that, is there any scope for doing that? Because I think for a lot of people they're just see, seen as a source because they stay up for a very long time. Just to, to say in relation to it, and I think it's something we can bring a more substantive report, but in, in summary, uh, the Council's Clean Neighbourhoods policy places the owner on, or sorry, the onus on the owner of the property. So very often the fly posting that's been referenced would be on, for example, DFI infrastructure. We um, refer those matters as a priority and urgency to DFI or whoever the property owner is, and it is their obligation for those to be removed. Typically, a DFI will say it's not a resource priority for them. But in the first instance, and particularly where we're dealing with public sector, it would be up to those property owners to remove. What I'd maybe suggest in, in the first instance, following this evening's meeting, is maybe we could write again, perhaps again to the minister, to actually emphasise the importance of them attending to these matters. The difficulty is we don't have the financial resource or the human resource to do a sweep of the kind that's indicated. I think what we can also advise, and I know our, our officers have, have done this, where there are posters um, by political parties, but not with a political intent, we have engaged, by that I mean it may have a community message or some other messaging, we have engaged with the parties and encouraged them to remove those. And I would maybe take this opportunity this evening to encourage them to do the same again. Okay, Adam. Uh, given that, uh, Chair, just to propose uh, what the, the writing in the letters, the Chief Executive's outlined, I was talking maybe a report being brought on it as well, maybe to propose that such a report is brought to, to the relevant committee. Um, and I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Seamus? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, this was something that came up previously, maybe before Councillor Gannon uh, was elected. And uh, I know that the council did uh, uh, do a sweep and uh, I remember one local primary school that had uh, paid quite a lot of money for a poster uh, advertising their annual uh, fund day and it went missing. And I think it was about six months later, uh, I found out that it was the council had took it down and and took it away for whatever reason, I don't know. So we need to be very careful on this. But I would, I definitely do, would uh, back Country Gannon's uh, proposal that we would do a sweep of all STLP posters and take them down. <laughs> Thank you, Seamus. And Tommy, are you uh, coming in? I go to Margaret Kelly. I, I might as well throw my tuppence worth in as well, Chair. Uh, again, this is a well. It's a perennial problem. The the issue of uh, posters and indeed, as Seamus points out, and I, I remember an incident when a charity again put up a banner on the bridge, and uh, I made inquiry with a council officer at that time many years ago, and his response was uh, at that time, my understanding, and again, I, I will lead on for clarification on all this, but uh, my understanding at that time was that uh, he could leave it there as long as no business complained. 
and if a business complained, he would the director would get back and give me a time frame to get it to suggest the people remove it. And that happened uh, uh, a bit of very worthwhile charity, similar to the the, the issue that uh, Seamus raised there. But uh, I think uh, at this stage, and again, we're going around in circles with this for many years. We have the uh, political posters, we have uh, sectarian posters, which. I would felt that as a council, we may have had some remit under section 75 to remove because they're definitely instilling uh, uh, hatred between communities and they're there to be seen around in a skilling for quite a long time. And under our good relations or clean neighborhoods, I think we, we, we possibly have some power there. But uh, the other issue that has arisen, and indeed we just, uh, I know in a skilling councillors, uh, I, I did anyway, received a, a complaint from a, an expat, uh, an ex-resident of Inniskillen who visited Inniskillen there last week and was uh, it was uh, rather upset to see the Israeli flag flying on the Temple Road, which is uh, uh, something that uh, is is all around the country, unfortunately. I was in Antrim uh, Borough Council offices last Friday and all along the main road, just immediately outside the council office, was bedecked with the Israeli flags, which is obnoxious to quite a considerable amount of the population. And we basically have to get to a point where we as a council can clearly understand when it is our responsibility or whether we have power under our clean neighbourhoods or whether it is definitively the role of DFA because every time a flag's mentioned, it's DFA and they won't step in. But yet, there, I, I have heard several times about our clean neighbourhood policy. And I, I, I would like an explanation of when it's our role, when it's potentially our role, whether it's whether we can say it's DFA responsibility, but we could, as I say, in the case of sectarian or uh, as has appeared in Inniskillen before, anti-abortion posters, which were distasteful and upsetting to a large section of our community. Uh, I'd like clarification on, on, on the, the lanes, because again, we've had discussions with other people that tell us that there is legislation out there to pressurize DFA to remove flags, but yet in the, in the, in the 13 years that I'm back in the town hall, there are flags put up, there's, supporting soldier banners put up and we all have to run around in a circle trying to get somebody somebody to take responsibility to take them down that they're having this impact so i'd like clarification so if i could just propose that we get a report back in relation to posters play tipping etc all the all those things so we get some clear idea is it our job is it dfi job can we push our boundaries a bit further and, and possibly embarrass dfa uh, to 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 take responsibility because it's it's it is annoying for people as I said the email received a visitor and he's coming back. Go okay. on, Chair. I am I'm conscious, uh, Tommy, that that is in line with what uh, Adam proposed that the report would be uh, compiled and, and brought to us. So you happy to second uh, uh, that the way you write to minister in the first instance and that that report would be uh, compiled and brought to us. Just to say, Chair, that I'm happy that the, the, the request would go to the DFA Minister for clarification on their point, yeah. but uh, added to that clarification from a Council point of view, no. what we can and can't and do. That's, I, that's I, what I, Adam I, had, had asked for. Yeah, and, and then, sorry, I'm going to bring Alison in and then I'm going to close that down because I don't think there's any point in keeping talking about this uh, until we have the report and that we're we're clear at what our, our views are. No, okay. it, just very briefly, Chair, and it was in the context of, of Councillor Maguire's comments really re regarding uh, flags. Um, members may recall a few years ago now there was a group which was, I think, FICT, but it was Flags, Images and Cultural Traditions, which was the report that was set up and um, reported to, if I remember correctly, the Executive Office. It set out a range of um, suggested protocols and arrangements to deal specifically with, with flags, emblems on in public spaces. And it may be worth in the context of correspondence now writing to the executive office to clarify the, as I understand it, the findings were, were broadly uh, received, um, that if they have any intention to now implement those findings, because it did envisage um, specifically a role for councils, including in some of the circumstances excuse me, some of the circumstances that Councillor Maguire has set out. So it might be just worth um, clarifying their position on that. Yeah. 
Uh, Adam and, and Tommy, are you uh, happy that that would be uh, done as part of that? I keep bearing in mind my earlier comment. Yes, thanks, Chair. Well, just uh, for clarification, then, uh, from the Chief Executive, if we, if the Council can identify who is responsible for the for the posters and whatever is attached, then under clean neighbourhoods, then they can act then to get them removed. Because I know there's a lot of frustration there with regards to car washes and things like that there, where as soon as they put the sign up, the council officials are on top of them, they're fining them, you know, making them take the thing in. So really what you're saying, if, a, if an owner of a poster or whatever can be identified, then they under clean neighbourhoods and they should be but I think where it's the owner of the property on which the poster is displayed is the key person whom we pursue. So not say a political party that has their name on a poster. It's not it's not them. It's we, the we would informally engage if there was a political and indeed we, we would regularly do that, but it's actually the person or the the agency on whose property the poster is displayed is where our power is within the clean neighbourhoods. But we'll set we'll set that detail out. So the council can't just for clarification, the council can't act on the person that put up the poster. Then they have to pass that over. Then say DFA for them to do that. Is that that's correct? Okay, and Eddie, I'm not going to keep going around because I think it's better that we deal with this when we have facts in front of us. So we have our, uh, Adam's proposal seconded by Tommy. Are we all agreed? So that we write to Minister and we also uh, uh, get the report and the information. Okay, that brings us nicely then on to regeneration and community, and that was on Tuesday, the thirteenth of February. Yeah. And for accuracy, page one, two, three, four, five six and seven and as mark's not here can i have another proposer alan thank you and seconded by diana thank you and for matters arising page one two three four five six and seven okay thank you members Moving on to our Policy and Resources Committee, and that was on the 14th of February. And for accuracy, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Stephen, you're happy to propose, and a seconder. Uh, Shirley, thank you. Matters arising. Page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Page seven. Chair, just to note in relation to the matters raised under any other business about childcare provision, just to advise that an expression of interest a process is about to embark for CKS Centre and based on informal feedback and, and engagement, we'd be hopeful that a, a suitable provider will, will come forward in response to that expression of interest. And in terms of Newton Butler Community Playgroup, they have been invited to submit a further expression of interest to the Pathways programme from the department. And again, officers are assisting in that regard. And our understanding is the playgroup is hopeful that this uh, effort will be successful. Okay. Barry? Yeah. Thank the Chief Executive for that update and for proactive work taking place by and with the council. It's very, very important. Uh, we, we covered this last month uh, in the committee meeting, but uh, practical childcare provision, uh, affordable, accessible is a really important issue. And hopefully we can find solutions then for the CKS purpose-built facility and for Newton Butler as well. Thank you, Chair. Okay. And uh, thanks to you, Barry, for, for bringing that up at the, at the uh, committee and to be able to then uh, have the council work proactively with both organizations uh, and i think particularly when we're constantly hearing on the news about how important it is to provide uh, um, that preschool and uh, the provision 
earlier rather than anything else to be social benefits, social benefits for parents and all the rest, but to also uh, look at children's health and to be able to get um, referrals made and so forth and the play schools and play, play provisions all play a part in that. Okay, uh, Annie, uh, we have page eight. Okay, thank you. So we're going to uh, move to point 15 now, and that is to consider a report on the call-in decision taken at special council meeting on the 8th of February, that the council provides a letter of support to Brookborough LM Church to support an application for it to acquire land owned by the Department of Infrastructure at 1 Killarty Road, Brookborough. And so that's in front of us here this evening, members. So we have... Um, uh, three real courses of, of, of action there uh, to be uh, to support the decision or overturn the decision or to refer it to uh, the committee. So, uh, Seamus. Uh, th thanks, Chair. Uh, just on, on this one, um, uh, I, th I think council policies need to be uh, looked at in relation to to what happened on the night. I believe uh, the cross community group uh, lodged their letter. It went through committee. It went through the full council and it had um, ample scru time for scrutiny and everything. The, the letter from the Elam Church looking for uh, a letter of support, came in late on an evening of a, a, a special council meeting. Uh, a lot of councillors didn't even know what was on the agenda when they sat down. And uh, so I believe that uh, that isn't the way to to uh, uh, run uh, business, that the, the cross community group, and as I've said before in Brookborough, has long since from the from the road service yard uh, looked or sorry closed down have looked to rejoin the yard with the the station house it was an old railway yard they had a number of of uh, ideas as in a railway museum as it was all the one property uh, to 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 uh, do they have long campaign and uh, contacted the ministers uh, uh, to numerous ministers in numerous departments uh, to look for the the, the yard to be uh, um, brought back to the set of, uh, and conjoined with the, the station house uh, which is his natural natural home and it's a this cross community group has a very very small uh, area. It's the only neutral area in Brookbra. And as far as I was concerned, they had went about their business in a proper way. They had put it in for committee. They had put it in. It came to full council and it was passed. And for something to land on an agenda as we sit down or sat down, uh, and uh, by the time it came up, I hadn't even seen it on the agenda. It, it came in that, that late. I don't think that's the appropriate way to, to do it. And I still say that the only cross-community group in Brookbra, uh we had supported that. And I'm a wee bit uh, concerned that the council would issue a number of letters of support for the one project. Um, a lot of people in Brooper are, are quite put out about what has happened. Uh, and so I'm just expressing uh, the relevant points. I don't believe it was done properly. And so that's all I'll say about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, some of the points uh, Seamus has made there um, about short space of time, etc. Um, if this was something that involved a big uh, a financial uh, payout from council, 
Um, yes, maybe that would be a stronger argument, but there is absolutely no financial implication to the council in this. I was contacted by the Lim Church uh, basically to see uh, about a letter of support from the council um, as we'd already as we'd already uh, issued one, uh, incidentally, which I had proposed for the community association. I contacted the chief executive to see if there would be any uh, conflict in supporting the two groups. And again, come back to the thing where there was no financial implications uh, for the council. Uh, I was told that really there was no problem with the council supporting uh, another proposal. Um, it was here that the it wasn't my it wasn't my uh, my um, idea to to hold a, the special council meeting. Um, it it happened there, and that was that. Uh, the call in stated that the decision was reached without proper consideration um, of the relevant facts. It is my understanding that the request uh, from the Brookborough Community Asso Development Association, which again I say that I proposed on the night, uh, there was very little plans. What what their plans was on the site, and on reading the Elam uh, request again, uh, plus the additional information which I believe they have sent out again, and I seen an email from them. I'll be honest with you, I didn't get a chance to read it. Uh, but I know that they have sent out information again. But uh, the information that they had provided on their initial request, um, I would have said was quite self-explanatory. Uh, and the reason given for the call in that that the that the information wasn't enough. Um, look at, I don't see any problem with us supporting this. Uh, as Shima said, the the cross community group in Brookborough. Uh, does good work. Well, I have to say, the Lim Church does good work too. Um, they do a lot of uh, a lot of work for the elderly people, uh, regardless of of um, colour or creed. Uh, by providing lunches, I know they do it once a week during the week. They provide lunches for them. They provide lots of different um, uh, facilities for childcare and for play schools and all that type of thing. So you know. All we're doing is giving them support, uh, a letter of support to basically help uh, progress both both groups uh, going forward. And on that reason, I propose that the original proposal stands. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Victor. Uh, Paul? Thank you, Chair. I have to agree with what Victor's saying. We do great work, both both parties, the cross community group and the Elam church, both parties do great work. And I don't see why we can't back the both groups. I'll second Victor's proposal. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Eddie? Thanks, Chair. Um, I would I would back the proposal again, uh, similarly to the Ulster Union Standard DUP. Um, Councillor Green had made the point at the special council meeting in February um, as to how it could be possibly, you know, if there was if multiple parties had all come in, 10 different um, parties had come in and asked for support, would we send 10 uh, offers of support? Well, the answer is yes, if we thought they were worth support. Um, but there could have been nine that we found, found uh, worth support and one didn't, and that would be the, the implication as to what we find acceptable. Um, it's it's up not up to us to make the decision. It's up to us to determine whether we see um, either of those um, proposals to be something beneficial for the village of, of Brookborough, and it's it's not for us to make the final decision. So um, you know that's that's my thoughts on it. Um, I think to to not um, to not offer a proposal and 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 offer a backing for this would be would be wrong. Um, but yeah, our policy would state that, that there would be support for this. Thank you. Okay, Robert. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. Um, look, Seamus has raised certain points in regard to the proper execution, I think, of the dealing of the matter on the night. Uh, one, I would reply, um, we've had other items of business come to either full council or to committees that have been of an urgent or extreme nature and we've had little 
um, or short notice. We have dealt with those effectively and gone through. So I think this is not a precedent that has been done before. Two, I think Councillor Roof Eddy has said, uh, why would we as a council, when it doesn't actually go against standing orders, not offer multiple uh, offers of letter support for community or other organisations in regard to um, things that they would like to actually carry out? Uh, and I would believe in this instance, the more expressions of interest to actually take over surplus land sitting in another department that can be used for community benefit, for whatever organisation that is, is to the benefit of all of us. I, I think the um, the church actually, uh, as uh, Victor has said and Paul has said, do effective work. We shouldn't be downgrading them. But it'll be up to the department, actually, uh, who owns the land to decide which of the, the bids or the offers going forward that they take. So it's better at least there are two letters of support going in and hopefully one of them will get it, whichever one the department decides. It's out of our hands. We're only offering a letter of support. So I support it, and I support the proposal and seconder to go forward with this decision. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks, Robert. Adam? Thank you, Chair. And it's more kind of just a, a technical question on kind of the call-in process. Um, notwithstanding uh, the legitimacy of this call-in, I think Councillor Green has, has made his point very well on, on why he has called this in. Um, and, and I, I see, see Philip is here maybe, and uh, if he's speaking later, he could perhaps answer a couple of questions. It doesn't need to be answered straight away. But in terms of what what is the bar um, on the basis of, of that line um, not arrived at a proper consideration of, of relevant facts and issues? I'm not referencing this, this call-in. There's been call-ins before in the time council that feel very kind of haven't really, there's not really a high bar. There's nothing new brought and I do think there's valid points about the timing here tonight and when that was received. But just if Philip can maybe advise, because I assume any call-in is sent to, to legal counsel to, to advise on its uh, position, whether it's valid or not. But it's just a kind of technical question. Maybe we can get an answer at some stage tonight. It doesn't have to be now, Chair. Yeah. Chair, maybe I'll give an initial and, and later in confidential, I'm sure Philip can, can expand. To answer Councillor Gannon's query, I suppose the bar for call-ins is actually relatively low. The full details are set out in, in Section 21 of Standing Orders, but in summary, all a member has to do is to have the requisite support of 15 members, to submit it by 10am on the fifth working day, and to specify which of the grounds is at 411A or 411B, and merely state those. That is that is the requirement to meet the test of standing orders. Specifically in terms of legal advice, yes, we, we would, as good practice, always seek legal advice, but the only provision to require it is if it's a call in under 411B. Okay. Seamus, conscious that you've been in? Uh, thanks, Chair. No, uh, just to, to reiterate, um, we had already uh, give a letter of support to a, a, the, the, the cross community group in the village. Um, no matter what way anyone else puts it, this group had had uh, uh, been looking for this building to rejoin it to the station house for projects for seven or eight years from the road service yard. The Elam Church came in last minute, uh, came in with that uh, request uh, more than last minute. I didn't see it until the item actually came up at the meeting. So, uh, and the other thing is, no matter what way we wrap it up, there is only one cross community uh, group in Broopera. The rest of the churches, there's a number of different churches in Broopera, any of which could have uh, uh, requested this, and any of which I would have had the same opinion that there's a very small neutral space in Broopera and it should only be filled by the cross community group. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Seamus. Uh, Mark? Thank you, Chair. And I mean, I do hope, I, I do really hope that I'm wrong in this, but I do get the sense, having listened to the limited debate tonight, but even listened to the debate at last month's meeting, I do get the sense that there's quite an unpleasant undercurrent to the tonight's discussion. I think we all know um, what I mean when I say that. And I hope it's not the case, and I would welcome clarification from the signatories of the call-in that it's not the case, because that, that I think would be very important in terms of anyone listening in to this evening's debate. But Chair, but Chair, I think it would be useful 
if the chief executive and I, I think she did at last month's meeting, but I think it would be useful again if she could reiterate whether the council in the past has issued numerous letters of support to different organisations to the same fund or to the same ask or appeal or whatever it may be. I think that would be useful just for clarification. Yes, Chair, we have in the past issued more than letters of support to more than one group applying to the same fund or initiative. Okay. So, she must make it really brief, okay? I am, again, absolutely disgusted with Ulster Unionists. Uh, because that is just typical of them. If Irish, if a GA or anything is ever mentioned, they are the first ones to jump on the back of sectarianism. And I'll call it out, sectarianism from them. And again, that's what they're trying to uh, pull uh, the wool over people's eyes the night by, by that. So I'll not take that from the Ulster Unionist Party, a party that is uh, steeped okay. in 70 Seamus. years. That's it. I'm Seamus. Seamus, please. Okay, Victor, no. Uh, so um, that's it. I'm going to now, I have a proposal on the table here, so I'm not going to get into this one at all. Uh, we have a proposal. Are we all agreed? So the proposal is that the original decision stands and that we would issue the letter of support. Yeah, your vote, yeah. Okay, can we set up a vote? Yeah, it's a recorded vote once it's... Hmm? John Sellers, then. Oh, just. That's the reading of right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to do it? Yeah. 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 Before it gets to the but I throw a chair right on the Is that all? Sorry, we're, we're seeing that only 27. Are there any not voted? Or do I just be all? So 10, okay. 27 not voted? So, yes. 15. No, to abstain. 10? Yeah. Is that at 15 to this? And more to go. One. Okay. Fifteen four. Two against twelve abstentions for the proposals carried. Okay. So members fifteen four, two no's and twelve thirteen abstain. Well, hold on now. How are they getting in again? I'm assuming because of what I got. Okay, let's go with the original, which was what? 15 to 12. Okay, so originally 15 for, two no's, and uh, 12 abstaining. And that's, we're not just keeping, yep, so that's carried. Maybe take each one at a time. That's okay. 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 Let me just get this off. Yeah. 
Okay, so we are going on to item number 16 to consider a delegation of council powers to the following committees. First of all, is Environmental Services Committee consider a draft response on the consultation on regularly, regulatory proposal. RP7. So can we have a proposal and seconder for that, Paul and Josephine? Your second, Josie. Okay, all agreed. Okay, moving on to 16.2 is regeneration and community to consider a draft response to the Department for the Economy consultation on onshore petroleum licensing policy. Uh, consider the Peace Plus report. So, can I have a proposal and second out? Hi, Diana and, and Roshin. Thank you. Okay, Policy and Resources Committee to consider a draft response to pre-engagement on the Western Trust Corporate Plan 245267 and to consider a draft response on the Arts Council NI strategy consultation and to consider a draft response to the Home Office standard tier of terrorism protection of premises bill known as the Martin's Law. Josephine and Robert. Okay, thank you. Now we have our correspondence. So our first piece is to know correspondence dated the 16th of February from Derry and Saban District Council regarding the motion. Yes, Chair, the details are included in the correspondence and uh, Derry City and Saban District Council have asked that this be brought to members' consideration. So normally we would note uh, motions from other councils. Dermot. Thank you, Chair. And just to say a couple of words on, on this motion that uh, passed the Derry and City Strabane Council, which I'd be very in, in favour of, of the sentiments that they've, they've outlined. You know, there's a there's quite a number of conflicts ongoing in the world at the minute, which is, is causing, you know, a lot of the population to be displaced in different areas. Uh, and it's not lost on people that there is a difference in treatment of refugees from around the world, you know, not least with conflict in Gaza and the conflict in Ukraine. Um, Palestinians that have managed to escape Gaza uh, do not have the same protected status as other refugees, such as Ukrainians. So there should be absolutely no, there should be, there should be an equality of treatment among people fleeing war, no matter where they come from. And the EU should immediately pass a temporary protection directive for Palestinian refugees. Uh, however, given that the, the British government are actively supporting Israel in its uh, genocide in Gaza, I wouldn't expect them to treat Palestinian refugees with any dignity whatsoever. Uh, it's abundantly clear to me that the British government do not view Palestinians as human beings at all. Um, but having said that, uh, I propose that we write back to Derry and City Straban, Derry City and Straban Council, and outline that we are fully supportive of their motion. Thanks, Chair. Okay. John? Yeah, I just just like to second uh, second second uh, the proposal there from Councillor Brown. I also want to point out just how, how meaningful that last paragraph is. With this in mind, we as a council affirm our support to UN General Assembly Resolution One Nine Four Article Eleven, which enshrines the Palestinians' people's right of return, because there are people in Gaza today that are actually making a stand that they're going to die in Gaza maybe tonight or the night after, because they know from previous ex experience that if they leave, they're never going to get back to their homeland because that is what, is what happened to their parents, their grandparents and the people before them. So with all that in mind, that they should be allowed to come here and settle, absolutely. But also remember that some are choosing not to because they know how the world has turned their backs on them time and time again. Robert? Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'm sorry, I can't um, really um, align myself with some of the comments from Councillor Brown, uh, particularly in his description about the UK government's treatment or their um, assessment of people in Gaza. Uh, look, there are two sides to this conflict. There's two sides to every conflict. And the unfortunate thing uh, with regard to the uh, Gaza 
conflict is um, what happened, first of all, to the Israeli citizens, men, women and children who were slaughtered by Hamas has been overshadowed by their reaction to that, to the inhabitants in Gaza as they proceed a military campaign to sort out the Hamas terrorists. And that's what they are, they're murderers. And that is being lost. Sorry, I'm speaking, no interruptions through the chair. No, I, I, I'll do the chair, Robert, thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad you're going to do that, Tom. So I think we've got to be mindful that in every conflict, there are two sides. And we've got to realise that if we want to take a dispassion, objective view going forward. So those are my views. Thank you very much, Chair. OK, thanks, Robert. Aaron? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, my own sentiments would be similar to Councillor Irvine's. Uh, we could discuss this all night and back and forward, but I, I want to support Councillor Irvine's comments with regard to the issues that that really started this in, in recent times, and it was Hamas. So I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you. Stephen? Thank you, Chair. And just briefly, I uh, don't normally come in on this debate, but you know, you can't call this a conflict, you know, and if you're following the news, you know, a, a people displaced from their homes with nowhere to go, being relentlessly bombed and shot at from the air and from the ground, you know, murdered while retrieving food, you know, that's not a conflict, you know, that's ethnic cleanse and that's genocide, pure and simple. Chairman, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Josephine? Yes, thank you, Chair. Well, I welcome the sentiments of this motion. Uh, proposed by Derry City and Straban District Council. Uh, yes, there are two sides uh, to every story. Uh, who is the aggressor in all of this? But certainly the situation that's occurring uh, in Gaza at the moment is totally unacceptable. Uh, uh, the, the number of people who have been displaced, killed, injured, wholly unacceptable in any civilised society. So I do support this motion. Separately, I want to note, Chair, with some disappointment uh, that uh, Mr. Uh, John Kelpie, Chief Executive of um, Derry City and Straban District Council, has failed uh, to spell our Chief Executive's name correctly. Mm -hmm. And he has also got her title incorrectly. And I, I think that is quite discourteous, Chair. Thank you. Julie noted. And Adam? Thank you, Chair. Look, I, I totally understand. I think anyone here who has done their research and their reading and has taken interest in this issue, as many have uh, across our society, understands that there's two uh, deeply uh, conflicting positions. There's two historical narratives, both have validity and I think you have to, to look at that in that manner that there's valid points by all but and you know I, I'm, I'm frankly kind of disgusted by they started it who started you know that comment that this was started by one group on this occasion this is a long complex issue and to get into the the absolute ridiculous argument like a tit for tat oh they did this they did and yes both sides have committed terrible atrocities that is evident. But just because one group did one wrong, that does not mean that another group has a right to do commit another wrong. And that doesn't mean that innocent civilians and refugees should, should be mistreated. There is a complex history here. Uh, you know, when I think we tend to impose our own history onto this debate and this argument, I think we need to have and I think some councillors need to have a touch more maturity in recognising that this isn't just a, a one-off. This is a long historical issue with both sides committing atrocities. Two wrongs don't make a right, as they say. An eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. I think we need to have a wee bit of maturity on this, Chair, for the serious issue that it is. Uh, but uh, just to say that I'm, uh, I'm supportive uh, personally, uh, of of the the motion that we have seen here, I think there is a need for everyone to to support refugees wherever they're from, and in this case, refugees who are in 
terrible, terrible conditions and terrible need. They need to be supported. And not only after that, they need to be supported in going home. Uh, like we cannot have situations where like their um, parents before them, refugees are left cast out and with no right to come home, Chair. Uh, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Patrick? Yeah, thank you, Chair. And I just want to share the sentiments of Councillor Brown and the sentiments expressed in the motion. And indeed, there are two sides of this conflict. There's the side of the oppressed and the side of the oppressor. And the oppressor in this case is Israel. Thank you, Chair. Okay. So I have the uh, proposal here by Dermot, seconded by John. Are we all agreed? No. Okay. We go to a vote then. Carded vote. This behaves this time the vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. just trying to get him in a Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. just remind them that it's live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last evening, Okay, so the vote is now live, uh, members. Once you see the uh, flashing uh, small yellow symbol, that means your vote is live, and you have a limited time period to do that vote, and then thereafter you can't change your mind and add. Okay, so that's 23, 4, and 12 against. So that is carried. Okay, we're moving on to our next piece of correspondence to note the email correspondence dated 20th of February from Delready in regard to economic development and inward investment working group. i listen. Yes, Chair. So this is a request uh, from Dalradian to make a presentation to our Economic Development and Inward Investment Working Group. Um, Chair, members will be aware that the arrangements for the public inquiry have now been confirmed and the letter actually was received subsequent to that. I know that the economic arguments are certainly something that are likely to be uh, visited on various sides in relation to the inquiry. So therefore, I would have thought it more appropriate to await the presentation after the conclusion of the public inquiry, but for members' consideration. Okay. Mark? Thank, thank you, Chair. And I, I'd propose to note the correspondence. And I mean, I, I read it and I think it makes perfect sense in, in terms of Dalradian meeting with that economic working group, particularly given the emphasis or the importance that we've placed on that group in recent weeks and months. Um, and I'll, we'll take the chief executive's guidance and judgment on that. But I wouldn't like to think just because there's the public inquiry going on that it would prohibit or limit um, organizations or companies such as that really engaging with the council in an appropriate manner. I think, Chair, just sticking on the same theme, I think it would be useful, particularly now as the chief executive has referred to the, the fact that the public inquiry is now about to commence, it would be useful if we could get an up-to-date assessment in terms of the potential rates generated, the, the potential for rates to be generated had, if this scheme were to be approved um, on an annual basis, because I think that that should, if nothing else, focus minds in terms of if this council is pulling back on or cutting services effectively on not spending money on things that it should be. Um, if we have a project like this with the potential to generate the rates to the potential that I believe it may do, um, it, it's important that we as councillors consider all of that. And no doubt it'll come up in the public inquiry anyway, and I'm sure it's a very strong argument within the public inquiry. But I think in this position as councillors, I think it would be useful to know that. And then finally, Chair, as the Chief Executive again has indicated about the public inquiry, I'm sure, and I know her and she and I have been in email correspondence or exchange about this briefly, but I do just put it on record again, I do look forward to all of the decisions in relation to procurement and going out to get expert advice, independent expert advice, all of those procurements and all of those approvals coming through the necessary and appropriate mechanisms within the council. And by that, I mean up through the PNR committee and ultimately to the council for approval. Thank you. Chair, just in relation to the latter points by Councillor Ovens, I suppose the councillor has, or sorry, the council has resolved a position in relation to the procurement of area services. 
Everything is being procured in accordance with our policies. There will be, as I think, as I've mentioned to the councillor separately, uh, an update report which would be provided as part of the normal tenders and procurements. It's inaccurate, however, to suggest that further approvals are required by the council. They're not. Okay, David. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is just in relation to the planning committee. I, I sit on the working group, or will hope to sit on the working group. Does the planning committee members have any conflict there speaking with this group? Thank you. Uh, yes, Chair. It would be our advice that as there are still some matter, sorry, some applications relating to Dalradian which are before the council as opposed to before the inquiry, that it it wouldn't be appropriate for members of the planning committee to engage um, with the company other than if they were to engage, they would then have to subsequently declare an interest on the matter. Okay, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'm happy enough to second uh, noting the correspondence, although the one remark that I would just uh, make is that in terms of focus in the mind around potential costs and opportunity costs, there is one thing that we should always bear in mind, which is that if we look at abandoned mines the world over, the costs that have been generated as a result of the fact that there hasn't been funding put in place to be able to deal with the consequences of uh, toxic mining is substantial and has had negative consequences for communities the world over. And so I think that we need to bear that in mind whenever uh, Dalradian are attempting to invite this kind of activity into our own community. Okay, Seamus. Uh, thank you. Uh, it comes as no, no surprise to me that uh, the Ulster Unionist Party is uh, allegedly supporting this uh, toxic company. Uh, and it just is it getting a wee bit tiresome, Councillor Ovens, his innuendo and his uh, accusations. Uh, there seems to be some kind of a, an under thread that he's, that he's actually accusing somebody of something, you know, that's not quite right. If he just come out and say it, instead of uh, hiding behind veiled uh, innuendo, Maybe it'd be a good thing, and maybe the the smug smile would be wiped of his face. Then, Patrick, thank you, Chair. Um, the Radian have um, offered really nothing of public interest to the local community. Um, in my own DA of Mitterone, I think that's um, well known, and our position has been well known on this issue as well. So, I would actually propose that we um, don't meet with them at all, or offer them that opportunity if that's possible. Thank you, Chair. Tommy. Carly, thank you, Chair. And I'm, again, uh, I believe in the previous mandate, any communication from Dalrady, and as a member of the planning committee, I usually declared an interest. So I'm, I'm quite happy even to declare an interest, that, although there may not be a major conflict there on, on this communication, if that could be recorded. And uh, similar to Councillor Green, I'm becoming continuously unimpressed by the continual interrogation of previous decisions made by this council by some members who seem to think that uh, uh, there are some uh, financial irregularities in the past, which uh, may have led to the uh, some scurrilous remarks in the local press last week, which insinuated, uh, well, I'll not repeat the phrase, it was out there in the public, but of course, the, the, the same uh, article talked about an increasingly impressive uh, member to the council, and I have, again I'll reiterate, I'm becoming increasingly unimpressed by some of the members of the council at the moment. Guru Maga to Carly. Okay, Robert. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Tom. Um, I don't know what we've done to Councillor Green tonight, but he's he's definitely jumping up and down and throwing. Um, remarks across the chamber and I'm not going to throw remarks back across the chamber uh, but in reply uh, no, that's all right I'm, I'm a bit hard of hearing sorry councillor I can't hear that but that's, that's okay. beside the point um, in reply possibly to councillor Donnelly I believe that within our uh, plan strategy um, there are um, arrangements in place for restoration in regard to mining. And I'm just not talking about one particular type of mining. I'm talking about all type of mining. So we need to bear that in mind that we, when we've adopted our plan strategy, we realize the, the issue, the long-term issue of restoration, and that has been taken care of. And I think we can talk about that at a later stage. So thank you. Okay, Robert, pick it. Thank you, Chair. I'm gonna be very brief. 
uh, we keep hearing this. Uh, we keep hearing this this uh, word toxic again and again, and we still we still don't know if where the toxic's coming out of in this mine uh, that the Radian has has uh, is planning. Uh, also, last week we talked about the potential of three hundred jobs being lost uh, in this district. Uh, and we hope certainly that doesn't happen. But I think it's fair to say that the Radian, uh, and we can only we can only take them at, at their word. Uh, there is a lot of uh, a potential there to create a lot of employment and and going forward on that. And just to close off on the on the mine when the mines are finished, whatever, nothing more in them. Uh, that the Radian has quite openly. Um, said that they, they will be restored to to the correct uh, order uh, to suit the environment around it. So I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. Patrick? Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd just like to second Councillor Patrick Withers' proposal and also maybe Councillor Victor Warrington might need to declare an interest as he knows so much about it. And Adam? Uh, Chair, I'd be glad I'm not going to make any sort of <laughs> accusations or insinuations. Uh, but um, I think th the point of the public inquiry is to put everything on the table. So that's environmental, economic. Dalradian will have their opportunity to, to, to make their case at that. And I don't see what they would bring to us that they wouldn't bring to a public inquiry. So I don't really see the need to meet them on the basis of we're going to get all the information anyway. Um, I don't really see anything changing between what they would offer at a public inquiry. That's the point of a public inquiry, after all, get all the facts on the table. So I don't think there is a need to meet them. Um, but I'll leave it at that, Chair. Okay, and... and Mr Chairman, uh, Carly, uh, just to declare an interest as a member of the planning committee, given there's a proposal relating to the correspondence, Chair. Okay. Diana? Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, we have an economic development and in inward investment working group, and I think the purpose of that is not to turn away from any source of economic investment. That's not to say this will happen, but I think really we should approach this with an open mind. It's only a small working group. It can be briefed. I don't think we've had engagement with Dal Radian for, for some considerable time. We can seek assurances, uh, their plans, how they intend to execute those plans, how they intend at the end to close off their operations. I think a little knowledge is probably better than, than not no knowledge at all. And I think that it's the... It is actually just the working group they're proposing to meet. So I propose that we do go ahead with that. Thank you, Chair. And just bearing in mind what the Chief Executive said there about just a, um, the uh, inquiry and more appropriate to do it after the inquiry. Um, Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Just like others, I'm going to air and say the caution and declare an interest as a member of the plan committee, Chair. Okay, uh, can I check just to see if all planning committee members wish to uh, declare a conflict there? So, okay, we're going to take that on mass then. Uh, so all of us are declaring a conflict there. And Barry? Yeah, just as a member of the Economic Development and Inward Investment Group, Working Group, I would want to take the advice of the Chief Executive in this matter. Don't think it's appropriate. Definitely wrong time, and uh, we haven't actually had any external engagement yet. Um, where would we start at the most contentious element? Thank you. And John? Just as a point of order, you know when you declare an interest, see if it goes to a vote, would the members be abstaining or just not voting to, at all? Not voting. Not voting at all. Just Okay, now that John is uh, happily content on that point of procedure, I have a proposal on the uh, table here uh, that we don't meet with the company, and that was proposed by Patrick and seconded by Podrigine. So, are we all agreed? 
Okay, I'm not hearing any countries there, so. So was the nose? Uh huh. Okay, but to vote. Just, just want to say it's Councillor Withers proposal seconded by Councillor Kelly, just so they're all clear. That's the evening. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So this is the proposal by uh, Patrick to to not meet with the company, and that was seconded by Potterkin. And the planning committee is not voting. Mm. They're on me. <laughs> Could get you out of that, Henry. Oh, goodness. I, was I wouldn't worry about it. Said that yeah, yeah. So I get you out of it a lot of times. Okay, so uh, yes, 17, six no's. Okay, so that is carried 17, yes, six no. Okay, we're moving on and Moving to 17.3 to note an email correspondence the 20th of February from uh, historic royal palaces regarding free schools at Hillsborough Castle and Gardens, an invitation to visit. Yes, and Chair, as you'll have seen from the letter, just uh, the Hillsborough is keen for this to be publicised, so certainly to invite you to share it with your networks, but it appears to be a, a free visit to Hillsborough Castle and free or subsidised transport as well. Okay, can I have it? Carl? Yes, thank you, Chair. This is, I think this is to be very much supported, but I'm prepared to, to note it at this stage, but I think it should be supported. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Earl. And Paul seconding the noting. Okay, members? Okay, we have no... Uh, we, have... we do. We just have two items of other correspondence, Chair. We've dealt with everything else in the course of the agenda. So item four in the other uh, correspondence folder is from the Clifton Heritage Centre. And it's an invitation to a talk on the 22nd of March from 10 to 12. And it's with Vicky Tennant from um, UNHCR representative of the UK and the Right Arnold Rule Baroness Richie Down Patrick. And the talk is specifically about the challenges faces facing refugees and asylum seekers. So it is um, free of charge to attend here. The only cost would be travel costs. Okay, members, if there's... All right. Proposed to note the correspondence, Chair. Okay, thank you. A seconder, Adam. Thank you, Chair. Lastly, uh, an invitation from Mid Ulster Drama Festival, inviting councillors to identify a play of their, their choice and to attend on one of the evenings of the festival. And the booking arrangements are included within the email. And <coughs> again? Proposed to note. Okay. All right. Second to note, Mid Ulster Drama Festival, very important, as you all know. And thanks, Chair, for your attendance at the launch of the festival recently. You know, you're a real theatre goer and we're delighted that you were about. Thank you very much. And as always, of course, delighted to visit Cagmore. Uh, OK. So before we, uh, that's all our other business. Before we go to any uh, notice of motion, in view of our time, and we have a number of motions there. What I'm going to do uh, is to uh, move on to part two, confidential business, just to be able to uh, take care of the uh, minutes there. And uh, then we'll go back to the motions. So can I have a proposal and second, Earl and uh, Robert?
Okay. And I'll ask Chief Executive to uh, summarise what happened in Confidential. Thanks, Chair. While in, in a Confidential Business, the Council confirmed and signed the Confidential Minutes of the Council meeting held on the 6th of February uh, and received a matter arising in terms of a legal update. Confirmed the Confidential matter, Minutes of the Planning Committee held on the 24th of January. There were no matters arising. Confirmed a Confidential Report of Environmental Services on the 7th of February. Again, no matters arising. Confidential report of the Regeneration and Community Committee meeting held on the 13th of February, adopted the minutes and no matters arising. And lastly, considered the confidential report of the Policy and Resources Committee meeting, adopted the minutes and there were no matters arising. Okay, thank you, Alison. I have a proposer and seconder, uh, Earl and Paul. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to our first notice of motion, and that's our childcare uh, provision there. And that's proposed by Shirley and seconded by uh, David. So, uh, Shirley. Thank you, Chair. It is clear to see that childcare is a huge issue for working families right across Northern Ireland. We have, we have some of the highest childcare costs anywhere in the United Kingdom. In fact, we are on a par with central London. The average cost of a full-time childcare place in Northern Ireland at the moment is £170 per week, making a massive impact on parents and families who are, are already struggling with the cost of living. The Northern Ireland childcare survey carried out by employers for childcare last year highlighted that costs have increased by 14 per cent since, since 2021. For 41 per cent of parents, childcare is the largest monthly outgoing ahead of mortgage or rental costs, and many families have to use means other than their income to pay for childcare, including savings, credit cards and loans. There is no doubt that the cost of childcare is having a crippling effect on families right now, and we need to see urgent and significant investment in the childcare sector. Childcare is vital for the economy. If people are opting out of the workforce, then it will have an economic impact. It's particularly vital for the delivery of some of our most important public services and health and education. Whether it's nurses, carers or classroom assistants, if they can't assess affordable childcare, then they may have to make the decision that it isn't viable for them to work. Poor childcare provision also impacts the local economy. In rural areas such as in mid Tyrone, it is particularly difficult for parents to access childcare provision as there are simply not enough available spaces. High quality affordable childcare plays an essential role in tackling disadvantage by enabling parents to work and helping to give their families the best start in life. We must do more to improve the access to adequate childcare and that includes childcare for families with children with special educational needs. We must ensure that a new early years and childcare strategy focuses on meeting their needs as well as the needs of others. 71% of childcare providers describe their current financial position as distressed or struggling, meaning they are in immediate risk of closure or are focused on survival for the next 12 months. Our childcare providers face very real pressures in trying to keep their doors open with increased operating costs and difficulties in recruiting and retaining staff. Affordable childcare continues to present a significant barrier to many people finding work and staying in employment. The DUP supports the need for flexible childcare work policies and wraparound school provision that is co-designed with parents, teachers and employers. The DUP has a track record of prioritising the need for childcare provision to help working families. We are the only Northern Ireland party to have clearly evidenced our commitment to deliver on this by past action and ongoing work. We are committed to delivering a childcare strategy and this has been our position for some time. It was under DUP education ministers that this has progressed in recent years and in our most recent policy commitments, including our manifesto and our April 2022 Helping Working Families document. We committed to the priority of delivering 30 hours free childcare per, per week for three to four year olds as part of our plan for Northern Ireland. We are committed to helping working families. 
However, it would be remiss of me not to mention the significant challenges facing education at early years in the current economic climate. The recent budget imposed by the Secretary of State stands to constrain rather than empower the Department of Education or the Education Authority to progress the vital issue of childcare provision. Previous estimates indicate that an additional 38 million would be required to implement the 30 hours commitment for all working parents. There would also be a need to ramp up additional capacity in terms of staff and premises. With this in mind, the DUP will work in the restored assembly, executive and assembly to deliver the change that parents and the childcare sector desperately seek. That means working with the other parties to introduce a childcare strategy as a priority, which will deliver affordable, flexible, high quality provision of early education and care initiatives. This Council should accept the commitment to delivering a childcare strategy which helps working families get back to work and stay in work. Thank you. David? Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, Councillor Hawks has well set out here the challenges facing parents within our district in relation to childcare. And if I could just add a, a few comments, Chair. Firstly, as Councillor Hawks has stated, childcare is vital for our economy here in Northern Ireland. The word vital has been used quite a bit in relation to childcare, and rightly so. The word vital, what does it mean? It means necessary for the success or continued existence of something or extremely important. What a word that is, and is a word that we use often in terms of our health service, our education and our economy, and rightly so. In any economy, the workforce is the most important part and is key in any business. If you go and ask any business at the moment, including the council even here, getting and retaining staff is one of the biggest challenges they face. If parents are not able to find or more importantly afford childcare, then someone must not work and stay at home to carry out the very important role of raising their children. I myself am searching for at least two members of staff for a considerable length of time. They can't be got. You advertise on social media, you advertise in the papers, nobody comes forward. So childcare is vital to the local business and the economy. Furthermore, as the increase in minimum wage comes into effect, Many childcare facilities are having to increase their charges to parents, whilst others may have to take the difficult decision to close their doors. Parents just can't simply afford it. Affordable childcare continues to present a significant barrier to many people finding work and staying in employment. I would like to take the opportunity here tonight to thank all of our childcare facilities within our district. Some are large organisations and operations, medium size, and of course, there's hundreds of mothers who themselves are childminders in their own homes. This sector has one of the most important roles in society. Many go far above and beyond for the children in their care. And I would ask the Chairman of Council, maybe this is not the most appropriate time, but if we could maybe hold an event or something to recognise the importance of the childcare uh, in, in our council area, the fantastic work that they do. As I have said, it is vital that this has got right. I know everyone in the chamber here this evening will be supportive of the parents and the childcare workforce, and it gives me the utmost pleasure to second this motion this evening, and hopefully everybody will be able to support it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, David. Yes, and uh, just from from my own perspective, I obviously agree uh, wholeheartedly of the importance of childcare and the uh, valuable contribution that it makes in so many different levels. And certainly we'd, we will look into uh, what's the appropriate way to be able to recognise that. Uh, Diana? Thank you, Chair, and I'll, I'll go through this as quickly as I can. I'd like to thank Councillor Hawkes and Councillor Madden for bringing forward this motion. Um, finding affordable childcare was a topic extensively covered by BBC and I talk back last Friday, so I would encourage anyone to listen to that. Contributions were made from the Education Minister Paul Given, the Women's Support Network, Employers for Childcare and Melted Parents NI. The programme revealed that parents and dependent children make up to 40% of our workforce, but so many parents are struggling to work. They're priced out of work due to childcare costs. Full-time childcare costs in Northern Ireland are more than £10,000 per child. The cost of childcare has increased, as was alluded to, by 14% since 2021 alone. 
The Austrian Unionist Party has for some time recognised the growing pressure on working families and parents excluded from the workforce due to these rising costs and the growing issue of, of availability of spaces in childcare. Sadly, the lack of an executive for five years of the last date has prevented any meaningful discussion or debate on this matter, but thankfully the issue is now front and, a front and centre priority for the Northern Ireland Executive, and it seems that there is cross-party ambition to address this now. The Ulster Party, Unionist Party would like to see a Northern Ireland bespoke and comprehensive childcare strategy that puts our children at the centre, works to make childcare affordable for working families, underpins and supports the childcare sector and is ambitious in the long-term aims of making all childcare and education facilities accessible to all children regardless of their needs. I spoke with parents at two different local primary schools yesterday and today and the common theme was the cost of childcare and how that impacts on those families. For example, daily full-time costs in our local area are between roughly 38 to 50 pounds per child per day this doesn't include snacks, meals, outings, pickups, drop-offs to school. And for a parent with two children under the age of four, this equates to over £21,000 per, per annum. This is just an illustration. However, the bigger point is that we do need to value the next generation. Federation for Small Businesses, Chambers of Commerce, The Economist are, are concerned about falling birth rates. And there's a direct correlation between this and the cost of childcare. We need children to be educated and self-sufficient to be able to support the economy going forward and to look after older generations when it comes to their time in the workplace. The economy and society cannot afford not to make this investment in affordable and flexible childcare. In Northern Ireland, we have the highest level of economic inactivity and particularly due to women opting out of the workforce for caring duties. We need people to come into the workforce and support the systems in place. This is an investment in the future economic growth and sustainability, as well as child development and opportunity. The UUP at Stormont will be actively engaged in the debates and creation of a plan and will ensure that the Minister and his executive colleagues share this party's ambition and secure a fair deal for parents and their families. And the UUP will be supporting the motion. Thank you, Chair. Perfect timing there. Uh, Josephine? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. And I would like to thank and commend Councillor Hawkes and Councillor Mahan for bringing forward this important uh, motion. Uh, the issue of childcare provision uh, has been very prominent uh, in the media uh, in recent weeks, and rightly so. Um, families are really struggling uh, to uh, find uh, childcare, and uh, it's difficult to source. And in particular, the costs are prohibitive, uh, very sadly. Um, parents are having to make very difficult decisions in some cases to limit the size of their families because they simply cannot afford uh, proper uh, childcare provision. Um, it is important that every child has the best start in life. We require very high quality uh, childcare provision uh, to ensure that our children are well prepared uh, for going uh, uh, to primary school. Uh, parents are prepared to pay out uh, uh, considerable amounts of money to make sure that their children are happy, contented, and that they benefit in every way from childcare provision. But unfortunately, it simply is not possible for both parents to continue working uh, uh, owing to the prohibitive costs of childcare uh, one parent is often forced reluctantly uh, to give up well-paid uh, jobs uh, in which they have invested much in terms of career development and from which uh, they, they have a high degree of fulfilment and contribute in no small way uh, to our economy and to the stability of our community. Unfortunately, it is often the woman, the mother, who has to uh, give up her job uh, to look after her children. This is something that should not be permitted to happen. We should support working parents by ensuring that childcare provision is readily accessible, affordable. It will benefit society, not only our children and working families, but also uh, our economy. Thank you, Chair. I want to support the motion. Okay, Adam, or sorry, Garvin. 
Thank you very much, Chair. And firstly, I would like to thank Councillor Hawkes and Councillor Mahan for bringing this motion before us tonight. Um, childcare in today's society has become an extremely important issue, not only locally, but throughout the whole country, north and south. Childcare costs have risen to an unsustainable heights and for quite a lot of families, not affordable at all, forcing parents to give up careers and full-time employment. My wife and I are both full-time employed and pay full-time childcare for our two children. We know all too well of the extremely high rates of childcare, but, um, but us, like so many other working families out there, childcare is very much a necessity and very much budgeted into our daily lives. On this note, I want to pay tribute to all those childminders, creches and whoever else is in a position of providing childcare and protecting our children. We can all say what we want about the cost of childcare, but I take my hat off to all those providing the vital service that my family could not manage without. I fully agree with this and support the call for a newly restored executive to bring forward a childcare strategy and with the delivery of 33 hours childcare per week um, for three to four year olds as a priority. So the SDLP will be supporting the motion, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gavin. Um... I have two minutes left, guys, to uh, deal with business. I don't believe that an extra half hour is going to uh, finish the business. So what I propose to do, I have an amendment uh, to this motion coming in. So I'm, I want to try and finish this motion if I can. So what I'm going to do is go to Stephen Donnelly, who's proposing the amendment. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, can I start by, uh, uh, first of all, uh, moving the amendment, but also um, uh, thanking uh, Councillor Hawkes and Councillor Mahan for the constructive way that they've opened this discussion. And indeed, they've outlined a number of the pressures that uh, I've seen in my own DEA of uh, OMA uh, over recent weeks and months. Uh, so we welcome the spirit in which this has been brought forward. However, we believe this amendment is necessary to ensure that the Council does not inadvertently sign up to a model of child care provision that does not work. Alliance believes that childcare is vital, vital infrastructure, both social and economic. It is a form of early intervention, early education, an anti-poverty tool, and a means by which to improve economic activity levels, productivity, and gender equality in the labour market. So we want childcare to be child-centred, affordable, and high quality. To deliver that, we need a skilled workforce and provision that matches demand. Alliance has taken the time to engage with the sector around needs, pressures and solutions. And the message that we've been hearing is that the free hours scheme as is used elsewhere in the UK is a good soundbite, but it's bad policy, which is why we have misgivings about the motion as originally worded. Having taken on board uh, what experts in the sector have said, we know that the free hours model fails children in low income households and has distorted the market for childcare, creating issues regarding the sustainability of supply. A model based purely on the provision of hours uh, uh, also centers around parental employment rather than the child. It also drives demand for childcare whilst failing to create any means by which government could influence the supply of childcare in relation to areas like workforce planning, standards and quality. It is crucial that we do move on this with the urgency the situation demands, but it is also crucial that we do not lock council support behind a model that does not work and has been proven to not work. Therefore, as our amendment alludes to, we need a bespoke solution that meets the needs of children in Northern Ireland. Other parties in this chamber will no doubt have their own ideas of what that Stephen, should be. Stephen, I'm rap rapidly running out of time here. I'm, I'm, I'm I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you think that the um, amendment provides the opportunity to be able to um, sign this, uh, this council up to uh, a vision of childcare that is affordable, that is workable, and that will deliver on the aspirations that parents and children have uh, here in Northern Ireland? And I uh, propose the amendment, Chair. Okay. And have you a seconder for that amendment? Yeah, Eddie. Thanks, Chair. Happy to second in, in the interest of speed. Uh, I, I'll, I'll not for, uh, go on further than that. Thank you. No. Okay. Can I? I now have to put the amendment to the vote. So, all in favour? Have I any countries? No. Okay. So, that now becomes a substantive motion. And in the order of trying to get business done if i could have agreement from the proposer and seconder to waive their summing up at this point I'm happy enough to do that so i'm putting the motion now to the floor are we all in agreement okay thank you very much that's that's good i apologize to the other speakers uh that uh, you didn't get an opportunity to contribute uh 
So I, I do not believe that I, I will get the business done in the remaining time. So uh, we are not going to be able to extend the meeting, but what I have is the option for people to, and I'll just ask Alison to uh, go through the options so, for the other motions. Okay, so very briefly, Chair, there is the provision for the motions to go to the relevant committee, um, which would be in terms of the next motion, utilising modern technology, uh, environmental services would be the relevant committee. International Women's Day would really be policy and resources. Um, though potentially we could do regeneration and community. However, members may wish to just take the approval to light up the council buildings purple on the 8th of March as that's time bound. And the use of council facilities could also go tomorrow evening or to regeneration and community. Alternatively, chair members, we could carry these to the uh, council meeting in, in April, but members may wish to dispose of them before that. Okay. So uh, basically, my next motion here is the um, utilising modern technology, uh, and that was being proposed by Nolene and seconded by Dermot. What do you want to do? Do you want to take it to the relevant committee? Do you want to hold it? Yeah, that'd be tomorrow night. That's what I was just going to ask. We would make provision for speaking Sorry. rights. We would make provision for speaking rights, or if it's it, alternatively, a, an all, a different seconder could be utilised or proposer if that's preferred. Okay, just hold on, members. Just give us a chance to conclude this little bit here. Okay, I'm going to have to press you for a decision here. Oh well, no, next council. Okay, thank you. And then we're uh, International Women's Day rushing. What do you want to do? Do you want to hold to the next council or go to uh, the relevant committee? In fact, the, the International Women's Day is on the 8th of March. So it wouldn't be. What's the next? It would be after. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, if you wish. This morning. Yeah, tomorrow night will be grant. Tomorrow night's grant, yeah. so that will then be in time to. And we just need to. Can I have a proposal and second or to? Sorry, is online available tomorrow night? Yeah, that's okay. okay. To seek council powers, just happy days uh, happy for the lighting up of the building purple on the eighth of March. John and Eddie doing that. Are we all agreed? Thank you. And the use of council facilities. Uh, John, next month. Okay, that's great. Uh, okay, uh, that's us. There's no other room. I have just one other piece of very good news that I'd like my vice chair to share with you. Yeah, we'd just like to let you all know that Councillor Catherine Kelly had a little baby boy this evening. So we would like to send our congratulations on to Catherine and her husband, Barry. And with that good news story, I wish you all safe travel home. Thank you all very much.